I want to know more of like the 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 the, the juicy like um you're friends with DiCaprio and like, I mean, oh, Ethan is part of that group too. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that look like? And how does that happen? That happens, believe it or not, from men's league basketball. I'm an open micer or like I'm, I'm so let's go back. Let's go back to my open mic days and I'm starting to get good at comedy. I'm starting to get a little recognition in comedy. I go on the road with Rogan. So I'm getting my chops. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, dude. Yo, you know the rapper Waka Flocka? I do. Brick, Brick is his manager, so I'm looking at Waka Flocka for something in my next movie. I feel like this isn't something worth sharing to people, so I'm just going to do it on camera. People don't think about it. These cans, they're just touched, and they're dirty, and they're gross, and people just open it up and drink. You don't have to soap in water if you don't have enough time, but at least give it a nice little rub. Yeah, rub it up. Rub it up. Yeah. And with that, theme music. The music yeah. kicks in. Show's about to begin, dude. Get ready. I'm lacing them up. Scoot doo. Blabbity blue. Scoot dee. Oh yeah! Am I cool with the hat or do I need the hat off? <laughs> what do you guys think? You think he's cool with the hat? Yeah. <laughs> I can hear it. I can hear it already. It looks like we'll be keeping the hat, my friend. Yeah. Alright, this is what it is. I've recently decided to stop showering right before because people bust my balls about my hair always being wet. And I agree, because I don't dry my hair. I dry it in a hat. Yeah, which takes a long time. A couple hours. Yeah. You know what the problem is? It forms to the hat. No, I was going to say no light. No, I love the way it forms to the hat. It forms to the hat, and then you get two attempts to zhuzh. Just two? Well, yeah, I, I, after that, it starts to frizz. Yeah. Do you have curly Jewish hair? No, I have basic dry Jewish hair. B day J H? Yeah, yeah. Basic dry. Hello? I don't Ooh. even like gel. I don't like lotion. I'm like on the cusp of an OCD situation. How's that cusp? I mean, I just don't like any, no lotion. Like I, I manicure, they're like lotion, no lotion, nothing. How's like, that OCD to not like uh, lotion? I don't know. It's just, I, it's, it's not even that I don't like it. I just don't want it touching. I, I, I don't think you know what OCD is, dude. I mean, I, I, have, see, I have friends. I have friends. Yeah. The, the, the lotion they have, where it's placed and how many pumps you do. And if it doesn't feel right, wash your hands again and pump again. You're right. I don't, no disrespect. You're right. I don't have OCD. So uh, I want to set up uh, real quick for, for, the, for the idiots in the audience who don't know who you are. It's unbelievable. I'm sorry. I, don't mean, I actually love it. I love my fans. And I'm blessed. So blessed. But uh, uh, I ran into you at the comedy store earlier this week. Correct. And I wanted to have you on the podcast. And there's, there's multiple reasons. But like one of the main, like, I think of you often, whenever I see you, like what I think about is when I first moved here, I drove here from Cleveland and yeah. bore my arms tired. And I landed in West Hollywood and I parked in my aunt's and, aunt and uncle's and I walked down to the comedy store because it was my first show. I found it on Craigslist. It was a bringer show. So my wow. aunt and uncle came, cousins came. Um, I remember I, 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 on my drive here, I stopped through Vegas and I had to hurry up and get here because I got a show at the, at the comedy store. Yeah. And you went on right before me. And, and, wow. I, and, I just, and I remember this was 2008 and I, in the belly room. Yep. And I remember watching you and you just sounded cool. <laughs> like literally cool, like not cool. I mean, yeah, cool is different ways, but like the way the emoticon with the sunglasses is cool. It's just like, look, what is this guy talking like this for? And I remember I talked about it on stage, like that guy was so... Fucking L.A., man. That guy was really cool. And I've always thought of you. I don't know you. We've only seen each Not other a few all. times very quickly. Yeah. But I've always thought you were a cool guy. Thanks, Rick. I'm not that cool. But it, my talk is probably more from Detroit than it is L.A. Mm -hmm. So when you say L.A. cool, it's probably, I mean, my accent's Midwest. I'm right around the corner yeah. from you. I didn't mean that. I don't remember even saying L.A. cool. Did I say L.A. cool? You did, you did say L.A. cool. Let's cut back. You're yeah. Very kind of cool, not specifically L.A. cool. And we're back. Yeah, maybe I said it. I don't think that's what I said, but I believe you. Anyway, what were you going to say? I was going to say, well, first of all, I appreciate that you thought my, that I was cool as long as I was funny. You know, like... I, I just, don't remember. You don't remember? You just, that was so cool. It was 14 years ago. it didn't ago. even matter. I re but I, the fact that you remember that night, I mean, that's, that's a great memory. I, I, because I remember, I just remember... I don't know. I've met a, you meet a lot of funny people. There's only so many cool people you meet. And I just remember like, that guy's fucking cool. I appreciate it, bro. I mean, you bombed I, though, dude. I probably did. No, I, don't, I don't remember the set. In the belly room? Yeah. I've done a thousand shows in front of two people in the belly mm -hmm. room. I mean, that is the root. That is where you craft. 
I love that the room. room. I love that room. I built my whole act in that room. Tell me about you as a, as a stand-up versus a writer versus director. Oh, man, that's a great question. Because it's not even... We'll be a, right it, back after a word it's, from our it's sponsors. Not, it's, <laughs> Mike, you're so funny. But you know what's more important than being funny? Being comfortable. Get comfortable, get going, and upgrade your wardrobe with True Classic. Get 25% off at trueclassic.com using code TISO. And free shipping included on purchases over $100 and a 100% risk-free guarantee with a 30-day return policy. True classic. When you look good, you feel good. And sorry, this is just such a comfortable shirt. Um, I'll tell you more about it later, but now a word from our sponsor. BetterHelp. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can help get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Tyso for 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Tyso. It's not even like a writer versus comedian. It's like I started in high school as a creative writer. I always loved writing. I, then I saw myself writing comedy. I fell in love with comedy on TV. When I got to LA, are we good? Are things happening? That was my, my warning I gave you sometimes when, the, when you're talking, I'm going to check. <laughs> yeah. I By the way, are you an editor? It. Yes. You are an editor. Yeah. In life. Dude. You are a life editor. What I've learned from this podcast is if I could edit life the way we do this podcast, I'd be okay. Be super cool in the belly room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. yeah you absolutely. say something, you go, edit that out. We're gonna do this. Push on me. Give me a better reaction shot, like on a date. You know, hundred percent. Yeah, I think they did that movie. Click. Yeah. So let me. So let me tell you. I started as a. I started writing. I love. I love writing. So then, but I loved stand up. I always studied stand up. Watched stand ups. And, you know, went to an Eddie Murphy concert when I was 12. My cousin snuck me in and fell in love with stand-up. And so I always How had... How did he the, sneak you in? Did he put you in a coat? No, he just, like, rolled me in with a fake ID somewhere at the Fox Theater in Detroit. A fake ID at 12? Or I don't even... Actually, I don't even remember how he got me in. Okay. But it was, like, my older cousins, uh -huh. like, two of them. And I was just, like, a kid at Eddie Murphy, for sure under 18. And so loved comedy and always loved simultaneously always had a knack for writing just could kind of hear voices and people and pick up their voices and comedy in particular would, comedy in particular but i kind of had a knack just for just for paying attention to people and the way they react and talk and communicate and dialogue and mm -hmm. so i was always into writing and then when i got to la i dove right into stand up comedy so the only reason i'm even saying this is cuz you said writer versus comedian and mm -hmm. i kind of feel like they're all like a blended thing you know i think there's a difference between um art and expression versus craft and business and stand up it's 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 writing and performing but it's it's uh you're a performer um it's not as focused as structure and story as like writing and i just it's different muscles correct and if you're doing stand up all the time and then producing and making movies there's got to be a conscious decision of a priority to be made Absolutely, a priority to be made, and it's very difficult to be directing a movie and think you're going to go on stage that night and do your stand-up. The right. muscle is in full effect in directing yeah. and and even writing. You're you're it's a different, totally different muscle. So you're right. So do you take off during production? I do, I do, and I didn't plan on it. I thought like in my first movie, I was like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a beast. I'm gonna direct yeah. all day and I'm gonna go on stage yeah. at night and it's New York City and I'm gonna be able to get on and work the craft. And by eight o'clock at night, I was completely spent. I didn't even want to get on stage. And I completely took time off of stand up, which was odd for me because I had been on like a stand up run of like a just a good trajectory for stand up and loving it and getting in a mean? groove. Just like I was in the groove of like five nights a week doing stand up. And then I, when I was able to direct my first film, I was off of stand up for like four months straight. So it just kind of like threw me like, mm -hmm. whoa, like. I thought I would do stand up every night forever and that you know and and when I directed the movie I was too tired at night to get on stage. And so that being said, I love all three of those disciplines, writing, directing and stand up a lot, but I think I love stand up the most. I think that's like where I come from as a performer, as a writer, I think that's my favorite thing. And then the writing, maybe the last 10 years, the writing and directing things started to go in a good direction. So it's just kind of taken me out of the stand-up a little bit. But it's funny because I was telling Burr, I was like, yeah, I was like, Bill, I feel like I'm out of stand-up. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. L Louis C.K. said the same thing. R relax. You're, you're learning another piece of the business. Mm -hmm. He said and the it, same thing after he, he had his go away or when he started doing his show? No, Louis. he when he was doing when he was doing his show, Louis, yeah. he was like, I'm so out of yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so out of the loop of stand-up. 
And so some people might look at it as like, I'm just like, what am I complaining about? I'm directing a movie. But when you love stand up a lot, you want to keep doing stand up. So yeah. I just felt like I felt like I was getting out of my groove of stand up. And after four months, five months, getting back into it again, every time, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm, I've done a couple movies now, but like. Have you every, thought about doing a movie, Mike Gelly's Groove Back? <laughs> yeah. Right, I have thought back about to that. Stage? Absolutely. You should see if you can get Kendrick. I'm a very, very like serious, not ironic, smart rapper. So. No, I saw. I saw. I was like, yo, let me get my Kendrick Lamar game on. Thank you. I was actually, it went out for, uh, to, uh, for his biopic. I auditioned to play Kendrick, but because of the times, they, like, they don't want a white guy playing a black guy. Yeah, it's but tough. I thought, they, I thought it was really good for it. Yeah, I think you're perfect for it. I think we open with this. Mm -hmm. I think Kendrick's in. Uh, I also want to acknowledge for the home audience, I'm not sure how this is going to be mixed. I have been so busy, and I haven't been able to do my laundry, and I had to do laundry, and I'm doing it, and it's still going a little bit during this pod. So if you guys are hearing it, I advise you to go to patreon.com slash take your shoes off to watch some laundry-free content. Yeah. Um, so you step away from stand-up for four or five months, there's a rust factor to it. But a movie, you're always going to step away at least for four or five months. When you start a movie and you're directing something, do you feel like you're rusty or does that kind of stay with you no, that, better than stand-up does? That kind of stays with you. And I didn't know it would stay with me until I did my second movie, a stand-up guy. So like the first one I did, I had never directed anything before. And it was, it was, called, my, it was called My Man is a Loser. And it was a- Put up a poster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a, with Rappaport and Stamos and Callan. It was a good cast. It was fun, but it was my first movie. I did not know what I was doing in the directing world. When they gave me the gig to direct it, it Who's was they, the, and why did they give it to you? It was the finance. It was the producers who financed the film. I convinced them that I could direct. Wait, I, I'm going to ask you tons of little questions, and I'm going to be interrupting a lot during this part. Go ahead. You wrote the movie. I wrote the movie. My man is a loser. Okay, so you write this movie, and you have not made a movie yet. Correct. Correct. And you like this script and you go and you have a lot of friends in, in great places. So you could show them some stuff and they're like, yes, we like it or whatever. What's step two after writing it? So step two was I wrote it and these guys the, who wanted to make a movie, who contacted a high up friend who, of mine. Who are these guys? OK, How, so he, you don't go, have to say names, but like, what does that mean? OK, Just no, but I'll, say, I'll say names. OK. My buddy, Doug Allen, who created Entourage, had some guys out of New York that wanted to get in the business. They wanted to make a movie. Just like Entourage. Just like Entourage. Were they, before they came out here, were they doing Mentos commercials? Yes. Fucking nuts, dude. Yeah, you've seen them. So they, they're in New York, they're like, we want to get in the movie business. We want to get in the movie business, we want to make a film. They go to Doug Allen to actually, they say, Doug, if you have time, we want to, we want to hire you to write a film. Doug goes, I'm too busy. Talk to my buddy, Mike Young. He's a really funny guy. He's a great writer. That was writer. awesome of him. Doug handed it off, just relayed it over to me. I meet with these guys. They come to town from New York. This is exactly how it happened. I meet him at Factors Deli. Mm -hmm. Shout out to the deli. Put their Instagram handle up here. There you go. And uh, we sit there. Are these Jewish guys? A couple of Jewish guys. We meet at the deli. And they're big money guys in the tech world, right? They don't know anything about making a movie. Neither do you. Neither do I, <laughs> by the way. But I know how to write. Uh -huh. And so I have this in my pocket. I have this movie idea in my pocket. So they think they have an idea. So this guy starts pitching me this thing about like how him and his friends, they can't get along with their wives, but yet they get along. They can tell a stripper their life story. Mm. So I stop them right there. And I'm just like, I got an idea. I just, I, I pitch him an idea. And I have this idea for a single dude helping his married friends get their swagger back. I just tell the guy the idea. Long story short, he's like, cool. Can I see a treatment? I send him a treatment. Because this is what you already had written. I already had it written. I already had this treatment written right. for this idea. So he calls me like a week later. He I want to be able to do this without, without you stopping, but I know how distracting that is. It's all good, bro. So I'm sorry, but I can it's have all, to keep looking. By the way, this is I'm working a muscle right now. It's Great. all good. So they call me back a week later. They're like, dude, we love the idea. We make a deal. I write the movie. Hold on. I got to know the, the, the in-betweens, the, the yada yadas. Hey, uh, can we get a couple more pickles? Um, we love this idea. Um, send me the treatment. They read the treatment, and then they call you. They're like, let's do this? Let's do this. Give Just it. like that. Just like that. We want to do this with you. Do you have an agent? Yes, I have an agent at the time. But they're talking to you. They're just talking to me. Okay. But I tell them, call. I keep my agent out of it for a minute. I tell them, call my lawyer on Monday, make the offer. I said, you know, you look up sad, uh, look up writers killed. And by offer, fees. you mean the offer of what they're going to pay you, not to necessarily the budget of the movie. Correct. Right. What am I going to make today guaranteed? What am I going to get guaranteed? Right. They call my lawyer. They make a fair deal for my first movie. Are you comfortable telling me numbers? Yeah, it was, uh, 
it was like 75 grand. We'll give you 75 grand yeah. just to buy the script from you. We'll give you 75 grand. It gets better. So I'm gonna, <laughs> it gets better. So I'm gonna give you 75 grand to write this movie, right? So I go away, thank you very much. The deal's done, I write the movie. I thought you wrote it. No, no, I had, I, no, I wrote the treatment. I hadn't written the script yet. Gotcha. The treatment was done. The way it should be. The idea was there. They said, right we love it. Boom, okay? And now they pay me to write a script. I write them a script. I give them the script. I mean, I'm cutting through some of the, you know, some of the, like, the notes back and forth between me and these guys who are like finance guys and not really story guys. But they're still great dudes. They gave me an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. They hire me. I write the script. They love it. They go, okay, now we need to find a director. And I go into full, I can direct this mode, having never directed and anything. Is that something you wanted to do or is here as an opportunity that you found game time decision? You're like, I'll do that. No, this is something I always wanted to do right. to the point of like, even in college, I was like walking around with a video camera, Same. cutting things Directing together, what I've always wanted putting to do. a voice in a dog's, uh -huh. you know what I mean? In a, in a dog's head while I look at the dog. Wait, I've always dreamed of directing. Could you, what does that mean? Well, I don't really know how to explain it, but basically we take a dog and we make a dog's voice. It sounds, it sounds a little bit like a dog, and I think you understand. I, we never do this. You know, it kind of is showing people behind the curtains of the magic trick, but it wasn't really a dog in his head thinking. We were just being silly, and uh, every now and then, since we're talking behind the scenes, I want to let people in. You gave it away. Yeah. Um, me on a first date pitching like, can we play this game? And she's like, okay. And I'm just like, make a fucking funny voice. Yeah. All right. So anyway. So here blah, we blah, go. Blah. Okay. So back to the, they hire me. I write the script. They say we're looking for a director. I call Doug Ellen. I call Doug. I go, Doug, I want to direct this movie. Will you please vouch for me and let these guys know that, that, know that I could direct this? Have does, he never directed? Does Doug think you could direct or he just likes you? 100%. No, he thinks I could direct. Because... I had been in the room for Entourage for like two seasons. I've oh, were you a writer on Entourage? I wasn't a credited writer. You were but just I, in there I doing things. I was punching things. up jokes. I had an right. office there. I cool. came up with storylines. Which seasons? First two seasons. Best two. I think so. So we did this. So Doug calls him and goes you, and said, you should hire Mike to, to direct. Wow. So they did. And so we made another deal for me to direct. And then I go into full study mode. Well, hold on. Um, tell, me, tell me directing numbers. Directing was maybe like a hundred, something like that. Maybe okay, so. One hundred seventy-five on your first thing. Yeah, but then they also made me an executive producer and paid me twenty-five hundred a week just to keep it, the train going. Wow! It was a great deal, bro. I made a great <laughs> fee for a good year of my life. And by the way, it was just they were generous and they were cool, and we made a really good movie. And we and sold the Lionsgate. Hell yeah! Um, tell There's, me the name again. My man is a loser. All right, I think I'm gonna watch it tonight. I hope you do. I'm gonna hold you to that. Yeah. Oh, I said think. I mean, we'll watch it soon, but I think tonight. Okay. <laughs> tonight is the night. Well, you know, I think you'll dig it, by the way. At least before this comes out. And so we make, so they hire me to direct it. So I start reading books on directing. Mm -hmm. I go all in. I'm like, I'm reading books on directing. I get like Playboy director interviews with like Woody Allen, Barry Levinson. I start to notice Mike Nichols. And I start to notice that a lot of really good directors were stand-up comedians. Mm -hmm. And... I think it's just because of the rhythm, the timing, the understanding of like when you come into a storyline and when you, you know, what beat, where, where you, what beat you get out on. I've also thought about out. another way to articulate that, that same thing is as a stand up comedian, you're in charge from concept to execution over and over again. And to have an idea that's great is easier than executing an idea, just like to get it to be the way you think out there. And I think there's something about directing yourself with stand up. Yeah, so you're basically saying that your brain is already conditioned to do a... a to be able to visualize to, yeah, what I want to do. beginning, middle, and yeah. end, and you're used to that. So yes, there probably is a natural knack for that in directing. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So they hire me to direct it, and it's in New York City. They, they wanna, they're from New York, so they want to shoot New York. I've never shot anything in New York. Would you say that New York was a character in the movie? I would say New York was a character in the movie. I'm right. no Woody Allen, but I mean, I was trying to make New York a character. It was cool. If you have New York, it was great. Film. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. It was fairly overwhelming, you know what I mean? Knowing that I was coming in for my first film. It was a pretty big movie for my first movie. It was like a $5 million budget, which was a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had John Stamos and Michael Rappaport and Brian Callen. You friends with all of them already? No, I met. I met Stamos because I was touring with Saget. Mm -hmm. So I was touring with Bob and I said, I have this idea and I think Stamos is like the perfect guy. 
And he's like, give me the script. So he gets the script to Stamos and Stamos reads it. And he's like, I, f I love this. Yeah. I'll meet you. And so Stamos met me at the newsroom cafe on Robertson Boulevard. Newsroom. He, yeah, he, <laughs> he meets me at the newsroom, comes in, Stamos out. You know what I mean? Sunglasses, button shirt, button down halfway, mm -hmm. looking like a rock star. And he's like, this is my life. He was single at the time. <laughs> so he's like, how do you know my life? And so he dug it. And so we just, you know, the powers that be, the producers, they make a deal with Stamos. Now he's in. He's my lead. And Rappaport, I was always just a huge fan of. And I hadn't known, didn't know Rappaport that well at the time. I played basketball against him a couple of times, but he didn't know who I was. Are you a good basketball player? I'm a solid ball player. I, I mean, good. Are you relative. phenomenal? No, but. You were never phenomenal at it? I was phenomenal for like three summers in Detroit, but like I can't say now. I mean, like I'm a phenomenal, I'm phenomenal in a comedian league. Like you, you want me on your team. Understood. In a comedy basketball league. But you know, my dad's buddies with Bill Lambeer. I grew I up going to the I think, palace. I think you told me that. Really? So there's a whole, you, do you remember? We have a whole Cleveland connection. I do know. I was going to talk about that because you got Brent and me tickets to the, to, yeah. to, uh, the Gund. Well, what was the Gund? Yeah, which is now Rocket Fieldhouse. Mm -hmm. Something. Yeah, yeah. So another money thing. Yeah. So this movie, so just, you know, do you want to keep hearing about this movie? Yeah, but we interject a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but do, you know, cut me off whenever you want. So I. Let me Direct the I movie. <laughs> I direct we'll be the, right back. <laughs> I, by the way, I direct the movie. Oh, and I get Callan, who I know from stand-up. So Callan's really the only one I really know out of this crew. And at the time, I remember going on the road and doing a gig with Brian Callan. This is a true story. We're in Miami doing a gig. And I go, Brian, I have this movie that I'm going to direct. And you're perfect for like this dude. I go, you're like the funniest dude I know in regular life. If you just play that, I'll write it to your voice. Yeah, sure. Everybody says they have a movie. What are you talking about? You have a movie. He really didn't believe me. So that we were in a coffee shop in Miami. I go, I'm emailing you this script. The movie is 100% green lit. Tell me what you think. I give him the I, I give Callan the script. Next day, he re, he reads it that night. Next day, Callan comes to me. He's like, dude, I, I love it. I'm in. He's like, I'll, I'll audition. I go, you don't have to audition. I'm basically the boss. Like, unless my guy shut you down. Sounds like drama now. He sounds like drama. Yeah, drama. Uh, uh, Johnny drama. Yeah, yeah. It just says when the, 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 there was uh, I th it was. Um, yeah, when drama auditioned and the, the, nobody was paying attention. Yeah, to him. but it was it was it, that was for the remake of Melrose Place. So it was another thing. I don't remember. I think it was Five Towns where you know, he thought he was right for it and and he didn't want to audition for something, but he loved. He's like, dude, I will audition. I yeah. will audition. Okay, I don't even remember that. I fucking love Entourage, dude. I'll bring I, didn't you down. Even, I didn't even know you were part of it. I'll bring you down to, uh, yeah. to Victory. You, Great. You'll meet those guys. Hold on one sec. I want to show you something. Okay. Bro, can I take a picture and show that to those guys? Yeah, should I bring the Queens Boulevard one down too? No, I mean, I mean that's enough right there. They'll trip out. That's amazing that you have that, Rick. They're going to love that, bro. Um, let's, uh, let's show okay. them the respect they deserve. we got to get you on Victory. Um, I, I eat. Also, we're going to go back, but, you know, we're, we're an interjecting kind of podcast. When I tell you I love Entourage, I mean, I am a huge... I'm, I think this is going to be corny. I'm, I'm really going to be vulnerable here. I'm an Entourage head. Yeah. Said it. My buddy John yeah. DeWalt, shout out to John DeWalt and I, love it so much. We've rewatched so much, both um, ironically and sincerely. Yeah. Because there's some absolutely ridiculous shit in that stuff later on. Yep. That we love. I'm sure. And then also the first few seasons, especially, it's. It was a breath of fresh air. It's, it's so good. Yeah. And I watched it in college before I moved out here, and my understanding of L.A. was from Entourage. Hilarious. And then I move out here, and still I'm I'm reminded of. No, that's kind of like what Entourage was like. Yeah. I went to Sundance uh, a couple years ago with a movie uh, I did uh, called Futile and Stupid Gesture. Yep. My dad came with me, and we were just walking down thinking, like, we need our sidekicks to get into venues and shit. Like, yeah. th is this like Entourage? Yeah. Cut to a clip. Anyway. By the way, I was in Sundance with Entourage when they shot it. Did you get to meet uh, James Cameron? I did not meet James Cameron. But Doug was like, Mike, come on to come to Sundance. He's like, it was really during the festival, yeah. It was during the festival. Makes sense. And Doug's like, Mike, I got a condo uh, right at the base of the mountain. I'm, he's like, I'm. I swear to God, he goes, I'm leaving at like four. You could just have the condo. HBO already paid for it. For how long? 
I have a three day, four bedroom, beautiful condo with awesome. like a jacuzzi. I had the best. I, I wasn't even working. I How do you I know did Doug? Nothing. Did you grow up with him? No, I know Doug from basketball. Doug, basketball Doug is, is fucking. It's the best. It's how I got. Rick, it's how I got my jobs. It's the best. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a men's league basketball, hockey. All my men's league uh, sports have given me like the greatest business yeah. relationships in this town. No joke. You know, I get comments a lot. What's up with Jews in the indust entertainment industry loving basketball? And though I understood the observation, I don't think it's particular to Jews. However, yeah, I mean, at least, at least my bubble. Yeah. You, you connect on it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think it's Jews either. I mean, I think Jew, like if you want to go back, like Jews, we were athletes back in the day. There was a time where a few of us played in the pro sports. And, yeah, we don't know, need to go back that far. We don't far. need to go back. But I'm saying you said Jews. And they, but like they my did. men's league thing was like, I'd say like 50-50. I don't think it was like Doug and I were probably, no, Rob Allen's Jewish. He was in the, he played is ball Doug with Jewish? us. Doug is Jewish. Doug is Jewish. Yeah, Doug is Jewish. Yeah. But I met Doug playing basketball at a uh, in a league like on Wilshire and La Brea out there. It was Come an on. outdoor league. How how LA is this? So Doug and I we just hit it off, bro. We were, I was like because he was coming out of stand up comedy. Doug was a stand up comic, that. and he was pretty good, but he couldn't do the life. When but did he stop? How old was he? He stopped Ish. when he was probably 33, and 34. How old when he when, on, <clears throat> when, when uh, Entourage comes out. Maybe Ish. 38, 40. I'm just like, oh, throwing he, stop, he stops stand up basically right when Entourage happens. Basically, he sells Entourage and he's like, I don't need to do stand up. Well, anymore. no, I mean, like, I'm not good with like timelines like that. Like, Doug, we played ball, he quit stand up, he had like a VHS tape of him from the improv, and then he did like a movie called Fat Beach that he directed, mm -hmm. and then things were not going well with him. And Doug said he's moving back to New York if he doesn't sell this show, just like Vinny. He was he would li he literally was gonna go work. His brother had like invested in a hanger company. He's like, I'm out of here. I'm out of this town. This was before the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, hundred percent before. And so, and so does that tra joke translate with hangers and abortions? I think with your brain it does, and your podcast, your people are all over it. So Doug, he <laughs> Doug says he's going to, he's leaving town, and I'm with him when he gets the word that Entourage is a green light. And we're literally pulling up in his Honda Accord at a gas station. And he gets the word that they're going to make a pilot. And it was the craziest thing ever because he was literally going to move back to New York and quit the business. So Doug and I remain good friends. And to this day, we're great friends. Is and he so, from Queens? No, he's from Long Island. Okay. But Doug is like, he's like, a, no, he's a Long Island guy. But he wanted this to be a Queens show. You know, it was a hybrid situation. It was like Mark Wahlberg had his ideas yeah. of what an entourage crew was like, but Mark's crew was like way edgier and could not be like what the show was. You know, Mark did a little time in jail. He had some South Side Boston guys who were like way Same rougher with crew. Same with me. That's how I grew up. You know, I could I feel that. And Doug knew people that were I was friends with, like Kevin Connolly and Leah Nardo DiCaprio and like these other dudes that were like in a world that was like a different world than Wahlberg, but still in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So Doug kind of took both those worlds, mixed them up and like And how does how did how do Doug and Mark know each other? They had the same manager. That's how it works, huh? Same manager, Steve Levinson, who went on to create ballers. Mm -hmm. But Lev was the executive producer of Entourage. Yeah. He put Doug and Wahlberg together and he and the rest is pretty much history. But that being said, Doug and I just became good friends and we kind of like, you know, we clicked on sports, we clicked on playing ball, we clicked on writing and stand up. And so I was under my own deal, like a development deal when Entourage got picked up. So Doug's like, just take an office here, come in the writer's room. At, where was it, that at? On, uh, next to Target. I mean, Bowling. what's the deal with, with this, with what studio? HBO. Gotcha. HBO. So we had offices on like Santa Monica and La Brea. Yeah. Like a really fun office, as you can imagine, the entourage offices, bro. Mm -hmm. I had more fun than anybody there. <laughs> like they were all, you know, they were they were catching colds and working late hours and in Why the Why weren't you room. properly staffed then? That's a whole nother story. That's like a heavier story. That's like a heavier story that I don't know if I want to get into. Okay. Because it's um it's like a bad story. It's like a tough story. To be honest, I, I don't want to get into that story. Okay. Like I was, I was on, I had a deal at ABC when my time was up for my deal. Entourage was getting picked up for its third season. I pretty much assumed that I was going to get staffed and then things went left for a while. 
with, with things went left with me and Doug for a minute. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of a sort of a private story. And I, I, I don't want to get into why, I understand. But, but I went off and did movies and did my thing and got back into stand up. but I really did want to get staffed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you guys are okay now. Yeah, we're great now. We're great. My it, instinct, it was, is, my instinct is to uh, ask you to be silent um, and build a little tension of you, like maybe getting a little emotional about thinking about what happened. We push in a little music and after about four beats, I go, <laughs> I don't really want to tell him why, you know, but, you know, I'll at least pitch it to you. I think it's going to end up in the show anyway. Mm -hmm. Today's episode is brought to you by True Classic. I'm going to try it on. Holy shit. This feels so good. What the fuck is happening to my body in this shirt? My arms look great. My abs look fucking ripped. This is so weird. Is my dick bigger? I think my dick's bigger. I'm not going to talk about it. Whoa, and whoa. Um, so sometimes finding a shirt is difficult. This feels really nice. So I have an interesting talking point here that connects to not necessarily me, but a lot of people out there. You see, men's t-shirts are often designed to look good on certain body types. Think skinny models with six packs. Excuse me. But most of us aren't packing anything but a few beers. <laughs> Tell me about it. Actually, you know what? Could you get me a Coors Light? The thing about True Classic is they want to make every man look good and feel good. Tighter fit in the chest, bam, and the sleeves yoked to make your arms, ah, pop, and room in the torso to keep things cozy. Plus, all their styles are super soft and pocket-friendly. And we have an exclusive deal for our listeners at trueclassic.com using code TISO. Get comfortable, get going, and upgrade your, 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 your. Do a... Get 25% off at trueclassic.com with code TISO. That's T-Y-S-O with free shipping included on purchases over $100. 100% risk-free guarantee with a 30-day return policy. True Classic. When you look good, you feel good. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. I'm sorry, this is just, I just feel unbelievable. If you watch Take Your Shoes Off, you get it. I often say answers are relatively easy. Questions are what are difficult to find. That's what's so great about therapy. You get to meet and you get to speak with somebody who is listening to you and is also trained to understand, I wonder why. Therapy has helped teach me, I mean, I'm making this number up, but there's maybe like eight things that are at the root of why I'm often going to a certain way. What's making me anxious? What's making me feel insecure? What's making me feel confused? What's making me feel unsafe? But it's difficult. Sometimes you don't know who to talk to. That's where BetterHelp comes in. You could go online, get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and at any time, you could switch therapists. And if you've been thinking that you want to give therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy could help get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash Tyso today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Tyso. Yeah, I don't want to get into that story. Understood. But Doug and I are good friends again. We're, we're, we're cool. We've been cool for years. And, you know, he, by the way, Doug gave me my first movie. And after My Man is a Loser came out. Yeah, so let's go back to that. Before it comes out, we were at this process of now you're directing, you're overwhelmed. You got Stamos. You got, you got the guy from Atypical. You got Brian Callen. What's yep. his name again? Rappaport. Thank you. Michael Rappaport. Um, and uh, now you're starting. And Now we're starting. And how do you feel? I've, I got this. Oh man, I felt like I got this until I walked into the production offices and it was just like wardrobe, art direction, first AD, second AD, scaffold, and all of a sudden everybody's coming to me with questions. Mm -hmm. And it was fairly overwhelming because, but, the, but what I knew was I had a really good script. And so I was confident that if we just got what I wrote on paper, on, on, on screen, then we're in a good place. So it was an overwhelming experience, and I, I learned as I went along. But Give me some more details, though. You walk in, and you see all these departments. Like Live for, producers set this up. So when they come to you, you don't have to come up with questions, right? You just need answers. I need answers, exactly. So I come in there. So maybe there was two weeks where they had set up offices. My first, my, my line producer was already in New York City. I, had, I hadn't physically met him yet, right. but he was like a bullyish. I think it was like bullying me, like a, like a line producer. We can't use this and yeah. we're going to cut this because the money's too tight here. So the first day, and you know, I'm from Detroit, so I'm like, I'm not going to let somebody just like check me all day. And this, I'm like, who is this guy that keeps telling me what I can't do in New York? And so I get to New York. And they get me an apartment. I got a place up in Upper West Side, cool little apartment. Mm -hmm. I go into the office day one. Man, this is so cool. It was cool, man. Yeah. And so day one, I just yell out loud when I walk in. I go, where's Vince Maggio? <laughs> I go, to school, where is Vince Maggio? I need to see Vince Maggio. And I walk in this office and like this dude, this like Italian dude's got his feet kicked up on the, on the desk. And I'm like, all right, bro, 
we need, we need to talk. And he was just like, he ended up being basically my best friend on the movie, mm-hmm. and he killed it for me, and he was an amazing... He His title was really unit production manager at the time, which is just like a line producer. Sure, UPM. So, yeah, he was a UPM, and he ended up killing it for me. But like before I even got there, I just kept getting told like... Was he right <clears throat> with all these things he was telling you? Or you did know, you have to compromise? It, it was... You had to make compromises, and he was right on some things, but I think sometimes these guys like to flex their muscle, uh-huh. and you got to push back on the things that you really believe in and, like, yes. the things you don't want to lose. So there would be times where he's like, you got to turn these two characters into one character because we can't pay SAG, and, you know, this is this is going to run us over budget. So those type of things would happen. And, and by the way, the best thing you could do, and, and I'm not fucking a top director, but one of the best things I learned is how to stay flexible and just, like, be able to make a move. Like, if they tell you you don't have this location, get ready to look at this location Mm. as two locations. So I learned quickly how to be malleable, stay flexible, while not losing any of the integrity of the story. It's a good T-shirt. Malleable, flexible, don't lose integrity. Thank you. You got it, bro. Let's put it on your website. We will. (laughs) For sure you will. I think you'll sell 80 of them, like right off the jump. Yeah, and my, my margins, I mean, I make them, I make them uh, direct to garment, so I make like four bucks a shirt. Yeah, my next movie is about the garment district. I got you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so here we go. So I'm back to my man as a loser. And so, we, so we're getting ready, you know, we're in prep. So I'm location scouting all over New York City. By the way, back to basketball. Jordan Winter becomes my assistant, who I who I meet through basketball. He's like, hey, man, I'd lo- I just like, love, love, love I to be. I know that name. I don't know who that is, though. Do you know his name? Because I don't know how you know his name. Oh, I don't know Jordan Winter. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan Winter. Winters. Yeah, Winters. He's a, he produces podcasts now. He actually produces Rappaport's podcast. Okay. Great kid. He's So I know him because he's playing point guard, and I like we his We follow ad. each other. Sorry for me. You probably do. And by the way, we're playing ball, and in the middle of one of our games, I'm like, I'm stressing out because I'm, I'm not in New York location scouting yet, and I need to find a park for a scene. And Jordan Winter, unprovoked, sends me within like five minutes on my phone while we're both in the gym, like 15 pictures of parks in New York. I'm Mm -hmm. like, bro, do you want to be my assistant on this movie? He's like, hell yeah. I'm from New York. I know everything about New York, blah, blah, blah. So he, I end up getting him a job as my assistant in New York and he could stay with his family in New York. So cut to... You got me going all over the place. for. How are you feeling, by the way? Let's step away for a second. I'm very interested in this. I feel great. I also know that sometimes people in your posi- on the in the guest couch, mm-hmm. uh, every now and then we get into some real inside uh, baseball stuff. Yeah, and sometimes people will be like, "I don't think people care about this," and I'm very interested. And I also, when they com- a lot of people comment, they love hearing it. I'm interested. Yeah. I don't want to force you to feel being interviewed, but I want to hear all of this. Oh, good. Then I'm glad you do because yeah. I didn't know if I was talking too much or not. No, I love it. Great. So we go back to so we go back to New York for prep, right? So mm. we we prep the movie, and it's just the coolest shit ever. Now I'm the boss of a five million dollar movie, and I'm you know Wait, filming, filming two three months. We were six weeks prep, thirty day shoot, six weeks. Thirty days. Yeah, we had a thirty day shoot. It was pretty. It was it was heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's 20, quick. Maybe twenty six. No, it's 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 actually not for an independent film. That's a decent number of days. I'm, I'm so used to doing big studio films. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, you're used to 100 day Marvel shoots, Rick. Mm-hmm. This is an independent film, bro. So 26 days is is a standard. That that still feels quick to me. Well, <clears throat> doesn't matter. Let's I let's mean, not harp my, on that. I've been averaging yeah 24 28 days right around there. I've always so, heard you were quick, but I didn't realize it was because of how fast you do your movies. <laughs> but um, but I thought it was how fast you run the hundred. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slow, by the way. I'm so slow. Yeah, I we'll believe talk that. About that. It's slow footed, mm-hmm. heavy footed. Mm-hmm. So we get to New York and I meet my whole team, my line producer. I meet Vince Maggio. He's my right hand guy, making everything happen. How do you go from feeling overwhelmed? There's a lot of decisions to feeling like I'm the guy. And is it an arc or is it back and forth? I never felt like I'm the man. I just felt like everybody's coming to me with questions and I better have answers. Right. So as the director, you meet your art department. They're like, how do you think this should look? What are your color palettes? Mm-hmm. I'd never said the word color palette in my life up until then. Do you, are you into area rugs? Not, a, not at all, but I am now. I'll tell you about it later. But You are? Oh, I love it. If you go to Marshall Rug Gallery, we the corny thing, it's my father's rug business. The corny thing about it is you want to go to places that have a lot of experience with customers. As the audience knows, they don't have any customers. Yeah. They only have family. But we always say be bold, not beige. And there is no wrong decision unless you don't make a decision. Pick your colors, let it pop, 
do the room to that. We'll get into it. I just saw your whole childhood. I just saw everything. So I'm in New York. We sh- we were prepping the movie. My actors fly out. Stamos, Rappaport, Callan comes out, and you know, thank God for Stamos because he was like an all pro, you know, seasoned actor. Mm-hmm. So he's like, we need to table read. We need to get these lines down, and we just. I mean, I don't want to jump around from like location scouting to table reading, but basically I cast it out in New York City, except for Stamos, Rappaport, and Callan, my three leads I got from LA. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, we set up casting, we set up auditioning in New York, which was like the coolest. And you're in the audition rooms? I'm in the rooms, yeah. And it was like the coolest experience. I had never really Uh been on the other side. I didn't really have the language yet of how to speak to actors. I was reading books on like directing actors, literally like... They don't like to be told fast or slower. They don't like to be told, hurt, you know, speed that up, tempo. So I was like developing a new language. I think that that, and I've noticed that with directors tr- trying to dance around with me and other actors, I think that's horrible information that they have gotten wrong. And I know that people think that way. So you're saying it's okay to say fast or slower? I, I, I think that uh, when I start a new job and I've been fortunate enough recently to be more than I've ever been. I've just been working a lot recently. Yeah. And I've been working with a lot of different people and different directors. Yeah. And I am at a place where I'm confident in what I do. And I have now started, because I've noticed that they feel this way. And I found this out from my buddy DeWalt, who is, um, who the, he and his wife, Allison, are writers, but they their first job was on Undateable, a show that I did with, with my buddies. Yeah. And uh, Afterwards, there was like, we were t- like, there's the writer's room and there's the actors and there's there's kind of a Venn diagram, but there's different there's different physics in both of these worlds. For sure. Um, and there were some jokes that were cut of mine, of other people, of guest stars, whatever, because something didn't work and like, yeah, they didn't read it right. And remember John told me, yeah, they don't want to give anybody a line read or tell them, they just rather cut it. And it's like, it's our job to get the joke and do the script analysis. I get it. But sometimes if it's not in our voice, just say, no, 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 no. Why won't you just tell us this? Yeah. Um, point being, so now I'm on other shows and I'm doing other things. And when uh, usually the director will talk to the actors before, but if not, I request to speak and I say, you'll have to tell me, like, if there's anything that you want from me, um, not only am I saying I'm okay with this, I'm saying I require you to, I won't pick up on any nuance. Just say, not this, yes, this, try this. We, I like it. We don't have time. That's not the, t- just tell me directly, give me a line read. Yeah. Just tell me. And they go, great. Oh, I'm glad I know that. And it's like, why can't you tell people that? There are, they don't, they're, they're yeah. afraid of egos. By the way, you can tell people that. And there's different styles to all of this. So yeah. I was just saying from what I was reading before I got into it, yeah. I was reading actors don't like this. And then I realized as I went on, people don't mind line reads once in a while. People don't mind different ways of communicating. And to overthink it is just, you don't need to overthink it all. You know what I mean? This is a touchy spot for me. We're going to continue. I just want to address one more thing. It's bigger than actors and directors. Just interpersonally, people are so scared to tell people what they want. And I just think it just... It, it makes it makes relationships so much more complicated. Absolutely. And that's what it is. That's all it is, is a relationship. Mm-hmm. And all it is, is communication. Mm-hmm. So as the director, I just need to get what I see in my mind for this story. Yeah. So if an actor isn't hasn't been giving me what I need, I have to either give them like an as if or a or or by the way, you sometimes you will cut the line because maybe I wrote something that wasn't great. Maybe I'll doubt come, it. Doubt it too. But maybe you'll come back and go, you know what, maybe this wasn't working. Mm-hmm. So it's it's such a collaborative process, man. When it's when it's at its best. And as a director, you're dealing with a hundred personalities. And I think if I'm good right. at anything, right. I'm good at like dealing with a lot of different personalities, probably from public school, you know, just like knowing a lot of different types of people. Were you a popular kid in school? I was pretty popular. Yeah. I was I was I played sports. I like, you know, I I went to parties. Yeah, I was yeah. pretty popular, I think. You know, most popular kid in sixth grade. I got the trophy. Was so, the trophy? No. Oh, no. bummer. So, <laughs> yeah. So you learn. I learned a ton right off the bat, and you don't even know how much you learn mm-hmm. making a movie until your second movie, and then in the second movie, you're just flying through shit. How did going, the first movie do? It did well. Did man. they make their money back? They did. I mean. So the movie's called My Man is a Loser. Poster. We shopped it around. You know, it um, 
Tika Sumter's in it. Great actors out of New York City. And where did it end up? It ended up at Lionsgate. Cool. So it was a very cool company. Um, and, and they bought we, it. They bought it. Explain that process. So now we have this movie and we need distribution. So where do they see it? Is this festivals? So we, so we go to very, no, this was not festivals at all. So we went to like maybe five distribution companies. We screened the movie for them. By the way, I wasn't privy to all these conversations because I wasn't the producer. The fine, the money guys dealt with these conversations more than I did. But I knew, I knew about deals because I just read up on a bunch of deals and I'd been in the business a little bit and knew mm. what good deals look like. And so Lionsgate was the biggest company that wanted to give us a deal. I kind of felt like maybe we should have gone with a smaller company that would have given us a little less money up front and done a bigger back end deal with right. us because I felt that confident in the movie. And I think my finance guys for their investors wanted a big name behind it. They wanted like the good look of like Lionsgate. Yeah, especially because they want to get into the business. Totally. And it was a good look for them. And the movie went to maybe a few theaters, but went good, strong streaming. So it became like a really cool such streaming. A different, even now, it's such a different model, huh? And this was seven years ago. So it was just a different, yeah. it was just a different world. And it was highly publicized. And I got, I got, by the way, I got buried. Like, like the critics, the critics buried me. Like when I, I I'd never. Buried you as the director, as yeah, the writer of the movie? writer, director. Like, right. like, why would John stay? Why would he pick John Stamos as a lead of a movie? He's a TV. Like all these mean freaking things. To the point where I was like, I'll fucking egg this guy's house. Uh -huh. I'm gonna find this critic. I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna drive around and egg his it house. It was a different time. It was you can't egg anymore. Not anymore. Not you don't egg anymore. You, you don't, don't egg even anymore. buy eggs. Right. So, but the movie came out and everybody it did well and it was a blast and I learned a ton and it was a crazy way to get to into directing. And what does that look like to you now? This movie's out. Now I'm a writer director. So are there offers? Are there people meeting? Are you now reading other scripts? Are you only wanting to do your own stuff? No, I'm just kind of going with the flow on this. And believe it or not, after the premiere of My Man is a Loser in New York, these producers were, were at the premiere. They were like friends of a friend. And I didn't know these guys, but there was like two producers there. And they came up to me right after the movie. And they were like, hey, man, we thought this was hilarious. We want to talk to you about another movie. Wow. So in my mind, I'm like, damn, this shit is easy. Uh -huh. I'm like, look how this works. You just do one movie, then you go right into your next movie. So I'm just like, this is how it's happening. So I really didn't even believe it, that it was going to happen like that. But after Just like that, Brian Callen. Just like Callan, non-believer. Yeah. And so after My Man is a Loser, the producers from what would become a stand-up guy that I did for Netflix, they were there. They were like, hey, man, we want to talk to you. And so I got my next movie fairly soon. Is after that their my concept or did you write it? Or a stand-up guy? Yeah. Can I tell that little, can I just give you a little story on that? What do you guys think? Thank you. So, so they had an idea. This is like the same thing that happened to My Man is a Loser. But I had an idea on my desk already. Like I had this idea. I've been dying to do it. So the guy calls me, one of the fine producers. He's like, I want to do a, a, a story about a guy who's too old to play basketball again, by the way. A guy that's too old to play basketball, but he goes to, he enrolls in college later. He becomes a star basketball player. So I'm like, I'm not feeling that idea. Like I'm just not feeling it. I'm trying to think about it. So I call them. They pitch me that idea. I, I sit on it for a minute. About a week later, I call them and I go, I got the idea. And I always had this idea of like, what if somebody went into the witness protection program and just had to disappear, but was like the funniest person? <laughs> you know what I mean? And they just naturally were like the best stand up there, the funniest person. Would they just shut their personality off? So I pitched them the idea that a dude goes into witness protection and gets on an open mic night in the town that he's in and he fucking blows up <laughs> as a stand up and now he's got to hide while becoming famous. Uh -huh. They're like, we love it. And so just like my man is a loser, they hired me to write the movie. I write a stand-up guy. What, what are you getting paid to write that now? Last was 75. What is this one? Maybe like a dollar more. 175, you mean? No, maybe, no, like Still around 76. The same? Like, well, I'm trying to think of what I got paid. Yeah, same, same or a little more. You know, same fee, maybe a little bit okay. more. And uh, Admittingly, I'm very interested, and I always ask these kind of questions. I think money yeah, I mean, I don't, is I'm very not, relevant. That's great. That, by the way, I love that idea that you talk about it because I usually don't talk about money. Like my dad was in the scrap metal business and he was always like, don't talk money. Yeah. You know, but you know what? Then there's the other belief of like, 
put it out there and say well, what it's it a, is. If it's a boundary for your own comfort, I get it. But if it's just a rule that you subscribe to and it doesn't matter, it's relevant. It's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so, so just for writers out there, I was already, you know, I had a quote from the Writers Guild. I had my quote and my lawyers stuck Which to that. Which was from the first From movie. the first one, 75 uh, to write, 100 to direct or whatever it was. So maybe I got 100 for this uh, to, to write. And then- Were you- Writer director immediately, or write first and then let's see. Writer director immediately. Great, that's fucking awesome. It was beautiful, man. Yeah. And these two guys came with the finances, never a hiccup at all, and boom. Next thing I know, I'm like in pre-production. How well, big is this budget? Five million again? No, this is three. Okay. So it's less, but it was. I, I didn't care, Rick. I just wanted to keep working. Yeah, of course. Because coming from stand up and coming from this world, I always feel like it's over. I always feel like the next job is not coming, yeah. and I just have an insecurity, yeah. whatever that is. It's just always, so hard to do stuff and get it, work. It is, but thank God, man. It's just, you know, it's been going well, and I, I really don't even feel that anymore. Like, it's, I feel like it is, like, I feel like if you're good and you, I feel like it will keep going. So if you're good like and to, people like you, and it, it makes it easier. It does make it easier. So they hire me to, to write and direct a stand-up guy, and we make that movie, and... I mean, I don't know how much you want to know about the movie, but it was it was my concept that I had. Who who stars in it? Uh, Danny Abacasser, who's in like The Irishman. He plays the lead. Um, Ethan Suplee, who you probably know. And I love Ethan. Ethan's been on my podcast. Oh, Ethan's I a rock Ethan. star. I thought it was Suplee. Ethan Suplee, Suplee. I've known him twenty years. I never. I, I, Maybe he changed it. <laughs> um, I love. I've him. been friends with Ethan forever. Talk about I, a stand up guy. He is a stand up yeah. guy. And I called Ethan. I was like, dude, you have to please come play a dirty cop in my movie. He's like, of course. Just tell me where and when. Is he mustached in it? He is mustached in it. He is on the verge of. He's getting in better shape, so mm -hmm. he looks damn good. And he's just a freaking great actor. Yeah. He just sinks into the role, and he plays opposite Rappaport. Who's I like, want to plug the episode with him because it's a great episode, um, and uh, he's um, a great dude. He's he's my boy. I've known him for a long time, and he's I just loved him. Okay, so Ethan's in it. Michael Rappaport's in it. Nick Cordero, who passed away from COVID, fucking love Nick. He was one of the leads. Um, who else? Uh, Marana Tias. Uh, Marana Tia, she's she's on like uh, um, what's that show? I, I forgot her show. She's like a big actress. I don't is that, even, is that the, by the way, I can only name eleven actors. I should know a lot of actors. Is at that this the point. house cleaner girl or the? She's like the hot Israeli chick in everything. I, I think that's look the, at her up. I think Marana Tia, one, she's stunning. A uh, yeah, she's on a billboard. No, that's not uh, who I'm thinking of. But yeah, how do I know this girl? She's been in a bunch of TV shows, some movies. She's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah, she's always working. And uh, she's five foot nine. She is tall and beautiful and fiery. I need to speak to you about this role. Please meet me in my hotel room. I mean, in my hotel, in oh, the wait, hotel was lobby. She, was she, in, she wasn't an entourage. No, Emmanuel Shariki was. I'm, I just want to know how I. By know the way, that. side note, funny story. Emmanuel. I'm walking down the wrong street the other night. I, my eyes aren't great. I have reading glasses. I'm looking for my buddy's apartment, but I'm the, on the completely wrong street. Cute girl starts walking by. It's Emmanuel, but I don't recognize her, and I've known her for years. Mm -hmm. I'm like, do you know where King's Road is? I'm like, King's, I mean, King's, yeah, King's Road. She's like, you're on Flores. She's like, Mike? We know each other literally yeah. 15 years. So that was just side. Edit that out. So, Edit it out. <laughs> no, you keep it in. <laughs> Edit it out. She still looks great, too. So I make a stand-up guy, and we shoot in New York, and that movie does fine and does well and gets gets. And that's on Netflix now? It's off Netflix now, but Netflix bought it, and the, the deal with Netflix is like they buy it and they keep it. They own it for like two years. So, so how do I ran, see it? It's on Amazon now. You can watch it on Amazon. So just, they, like, just like uh, As We See It on Amazon Prime? Um, I don't know. Is that your movie? It's a, a, my show. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, bro. It's okay, man. Uh, what do I watch? If I'm watching one tonight, which one am I watching? My Man is a Loser, watch first. Then watch a stand-up guy. Okay. But it's both my tone, my comedy style. And a stand-up guy, that's where I realized kind of how much I learned from My Man is a Loser because I was flying through that thing. I was just flying through it. I knew how many setups I needed. I had my shot list good to go. I knew how many, you know, I, knew, I, I wasn't taking six, seven takes every time. Mm -hmm. I was just moving through it quickly. And yeah, man, it was like a cool blessing. So I wrote and directed that one. And yeah, Netflix bought it right away. And, you know, now I'm 
I've been hired since then to like write multiple movies and I that you didn't direct. You've just written some now. I wrote one that I didn't direct called Adam starring Jeff Daniels and Aaron Paul, which is on Amazon too. But we don't need to talk about the credits, bro. I mean, uh, I got a few movies. By, by the way, maybe we should talk about it because I feel like nobody knows who I am. Yeah. Nobody. I, 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 I'm like the cool dude in the belly room. You were one, one of the first like, people on, I met. Bro. I don't know who you are. I got petted. I've been around. Um, do you think that as a writer, director, <clears throat> people need to know who you are outside of the business? Outside the business? Yeah, I, I do. I feel like people should know that it's a Mike Young film. Like, yeah. You brand it that way? No, I haven't. I haven't done. A, I haven't. This one, the one I'm doing. Uh, let me think. Which one do I want? The next one I want to be like a Mike Young film, stealing jokes. By the way, I just forgot that I just freaking finished directing another movie. When? A month ago. I mean, I'm I'm editing right yeah. now. I completely forgot. It's called stealing jokes. It's called stealing jokes. Yeah. Starring Jeff Dye, Dustin Ibarra, Rappaport's in this one. What do you like working with Rappaport so much? By the way, because I think I he's love great. Him. No judgment. He's just in everything you do. Yeah, because I think he's such a talented, he, funny actor. And like Scorsese I, as Leo, do you have Rappaport? I got Rappaport. Yeah, because I honestly, first of all, I know what a great actor he is. He comes professional, as, as, as crazy as he sounds out in the world. He's always on time. He always knows his shit. And I know his voice. So I know that mm -hmm. when I have a character that I can write to him, it's just a done deal. Could and you explain what it means to know somebody's voice and to write for them? You could, you could hear his delivery? I can hear his delivery. Like after knowing you, hearing you, right? Just you have, a, you have a very distinct cadence. You have a distinct point of view. I could write for you. Let me hear. Give me a... Give me a, a Bad example, if you need to. Give me what do you uh, So, like, uh, how do you, why do you think that you um, can write for Rappaport? Hold on one second. Why do you think that you could write for Rappaport? We don't always do this on the show, but I'm from Cleveland, and, you know, I mean, I Take just... Take it out of the podcast. Put me in a basketball situation. Okay, you as a coach? <sighs> Fuck, it would you, be me as a coach, huh? That's, I mean, you should be. You, you'll play a coach one day. I could see it. All right, guys, listen. Don't step on the, don't step on the carpet when you come in here. I want everybody to wash their hands. What you carpet is there on there. the court? All right, Jimmy, you're playing lazy. I know you don't think you're playing lazy, but you're playing lazy. Okay, I, I could get your voice, bro. In two seconds, I could okay. write a whole show for you. Uh, that's what I mean by writing for somebody. Mm -hmm. When you get to know somebody, like they're they're like what they organically come across as. I like to write for people. So if I see that I've written something and that my actor's personality in life is funnier than what I wrote, I'll kind of go towards that yeah. and like give them something easier to play with that doesn't lose the context of the story. It's just an it's just a funnier. It's just a funnier way to do it. So I want to move past that for a second. I want to talk about you're done directing this movie, and now you're in editing, which is still so much work. However, I saw you at the comedy store. Are you now coming back to stand-up? Have you been doing it? Bro, I'm coming back to stand-up strong, Rick. I've been doing it. I went and did like five arena shows with Sebastian. Awesome. Uh, yeah. It was, He's one of my favorites. Yeah. Sebastian's incredible. Yeah. So we've been friends a long time and I'm coming back strong after I finish this movie into stand up. And I got a tour set up for September, October. I'm, I'm sorry, October, November. We'll, we'll put up, uh, this will probably come out maybe this month, if not being in October. <clears throat> So I'll, um, if they're on your site, I'm sure I'll find them. I might ask, but we'll put the dates up here. Cool. Um, but yes, I am coming back full steam ahead to stand up because I've like been reinvigorated with like writing new material and performing. And you know what am I going to say? I'm not. You know, I'll turn a movie down if it's like not if I'm not feeling it. But like I'm feeling stand up again so strong for the first time. And Sebastian was cool enough to take me on an arena tour. And I, I think you know that I was on the road with Saget for mm -hmm. years. I so I opened for Bob for years. So I was never out of stand-up completely. But like only when I shot my movies was I was I completely out of it. Is your tour going to be your tour now, though? Not you you following somebody? So we're going to have two things going. We're going to have a Stealing Jokes comedy tour. That's going to be like a 20-city tour. All the, like Jeff Dye and the, the comedians Dye, from that movie. Ibarra, yeah. Uh, ha Ha Davis, who's in my movie, who's phenomenal. He sounds funny, just from the name. Ha Ha. He's, have you met him? I'm not sure. I'm really bad with names. Are you? Yeah. I mean, I don't even remember Justin Winters, and we might be friends, so I do <laughs> apologize. And it's well, Winter, by the way. And it's Jordan. Um, I do know Jordan. Yeah. Different Jordan. Yeah. So we're going to do a tour for that, and then I'm putting something together, like a bigger tour thing that's going to be my tour with like various friends. After a Mike that. Young and Friends tour. A Mike Young and Friends type of tour. Right. So that being said, I love stand up, bro. Me I'm a, too. you know, I'm at the store tonight. It's just my favorite thing, yeah. and I can't wait to get back and dive in you, head first again. How do you feel you are? Do you feel you're back to where you were? Do you feel like 
yeah, I feel like I'm hitting a good groove right now. I feel like those shows with Sebastian got me back on my feet. I feel like all that time with Bob, even when I was in editing, got me back going. And I just, yeah, man, I feel really good about um, stand-up right now. Are you comfortable talking about Bob at all for a minute? Sure. Um, I never knew Bob. Uh, and like many people, especially my generation, I grew up watching him. Yeah. And um, about a month before he passed, uh, I, I was... Uh, whoever represents him or his podcast or whatever, yeah. they reached out that he was going to come on my podcast. And he was supposed to come on not even a week after it happened. And I was so excited because wow. I've, I've grew up watching him. And uh, it's also like, there are people you have on and it's all, it, this is always great. Podcasting is great. But there's some people you have on where it's like, I don't need to look up anything. If this weren't a podcast, I want to have this conversation. I have 90 questions already. Yep. Um, like, I'm so excited. And all you hear is how nice he is, yep. um, which really matters, especially yeah. when someone's coming to your living room and you want to, you want to feel safe. Um, he would have loved this. I was so excited. Um, in fact, a, an episode with Eric Griffin, do you know Eric? Yeah. Um, came out. And we recorded it like a few days before it came out. And I'm talking how excited I am that, that Bob Saget's coming on. Uh, and then it came out like the day after or the day of. And then there were some comments like, like, oh, that's why, you know, like. Uh, you killed Bob. Uh, no. Just like, oh, that would have, we would have loved to see Bob on. It's like, of course you would have. Of course. Um, By the way, this is his vibe too. Like, you are quick, Rick. You are quick. Quick. Shit. You are quick. Thanks, dude. Bob was fucking quick, bro. He would, you guys would have been going toe to toe with your wit and he was such a witty dude yeah. and just like you couldn't you know that was the thing with bob was like i mean there's so many things about bob but being with him for 13 years on the road literally we were like best friends and so i got to see why guys like norman lear and all and mayor and people at the uh, are at like the height of their own game respected bob because he had a great comedy mind mm -hmm. so whatever you might have thought about his stand-up and thought it was immature and dick jokes and this and that he had a true comedy brain that didn't shut off so this would have been cool for him because he could he could Play, I mean, he could be with your tempo, no doubt. I literally have, anim like you could see, I have animated dicks all over the place. I have diarrhea on my guests all the time. I mean, there's immature comedy doesn't, is, doesn't, does it, well, no, it, it's just. It doesn't get old. There's a primal thing inside. Farts are funny. And if it's not funny to you, it's because some trauma happened. <laughs> farts are funny. And people who do fart stuff are funny because there's something childish. Totally. And childish, childish. And layered and deep and smart and fun are not mutually exclusive. It's just kind of like a playfulness. And I have always found that when people are immature, you don't want them to only be that and always be that. But when people are little silly, immature farts, and I just always connect with those types of people. Of course. And you always can tell the difference between the intelligent one who's doing the fart jokes and the little ridiculous silliness and the ones that are just not yeah, that smart because that are doing it. Because, yeah, because if you're doing it just to be shocking versus you're doing it because you generally, it's a funny fucking energy. Yeah, it's in Pooping you. is funny. Yeah. And it's not like, I'm going to shit on your fucking head, you bitch. It's like, all right, it's not enough to be aggressive. Yeah. Anyway. Bob, Bob would have dug this. I could just tell you How'd that. you meet him? Through Entourage. I met him through Entourage. Doug through, Ellen, it seems like, introduced you to yeah. a lot for, for your professional and personal life. He did. Two key moments in my life happened through Doug, my first movie and meeting Bob. And when we were working on Entourage, when I was there, he was like, Bob's doing Entourage. You need to meet Bob. You got to meet Bob. Oh, you met him through the Entourage connection. Yeah. And they're like, you guys would be great on the road together, which I didn't even think of because I was doing like my own tour with like the Young American Comedy Tour. You know, I'll tell you about that later. But like I was on a tour and I, Bob happened to come through Tempe, Arizona, as I was leaving Tempe. So he dropped in on a Sunday night when it was our last show there. And I was like, hey man, Doug Allen says like we mm. should meet. Da, 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 so coincidentally, he was just there. Coincidentally, right. he was there. And I was just like, I dropped Doug's name, said we should meet. He's like, come open for me sometime. Boom. And it was 13 years of amazing. Did on you the connect road. because of first? Obviously, there needs to be a, a, a personal connection. But at first, was it he liked your stand up? So let's do it, or was it this guy seems nice, let's do it? No, he really dug my stand-up, and, and the me being cool with Bob came after that because, you know, when you're famous like that, you have to have, like, a strong opener. You can't have, like, 
you can't have it be weak and then Bob has to dig himself out. So he dug my stand up. The style fit nicely like with, with where he was going with his stand up. Why? Because I was more of a relationship telling real stories about life and Bob was more like, you know, off the wall, right. zany, so this and that. Different. It was a nice fit, two totally different things, different styles of comedy. I think it com they complemented each other. So it just became a two-man show. I did 30 minutes, Bob would do an hour, and that was it for 13 years. And so, yeah. We 13 met. years. Yeah, man, 13 years. Oh, man, I'm sorry. Thanks. It was nuts. Oh, Bob, Bob's in a stand-up guy. He was in my last movie, in my movie, oh, yeah? stand-up guy, yeah. And um, we worked together a bunch. We wrote a bunch of stuff together. And he was just like, you know, I, I I always say it like this. Bob just gave. He was just like, everything was output with him. Like, he was just gave and gave and took care of you and made sure your flights were perfect and everything was fine at the mm -hmm. hotel. He just wanted to make sure you were all right. And obviously, Bob was neurotic sometimes, so we would have our little battles, our little neurotic battles. But he was just, a, he just gave it all out, man. And like, I don't know. I just, if there's a higher power, I just say, Bob put all of it out, and that was it. You know what I mean? He just gave it all. He had never, ever done a two-hour show when I was with him, ever. His last tweet was that, I can't believe I did two hours on stage tonight. And that was his last show. Or he wanted to always do more? Or no, just he just tapped out at an hour five, hour right. ten. He was tapped out. He gave it his all. But I'd never seen him come close to two hours. So I just thought it was ironic that his last show was a two-hour show. What happened? He hit his head. He banged his head in a hotel room at four o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. And he had blunt trauma to the base of his skull. And that blunt and he was also on blood thinners, which like caused him to bleed out internally. Why was he on blood thinners? Just probably being 67 years old, maybe having some heart things. You know, I didn't know he was on blood thinners till it came out that he was. But he banged his head hard enough that it fractured his skull. And, and he didn't realize it was that bad? He either realized and was probably like so tired at four in the morning that he was like, you know, ah, damn, and just like kind of went to bed. Because when they found him, he was just laying in bed peacefully, covers over him, hand on his heart, and nothing was ruffled, nothing was missing. You know, because me, I, my first thought is like, who the hell tried to mug Bob and banged him in the back? You know, I started going down a dark path. And it wasn't. It was just he fell and he either banged his head on the head on the headboard or in the bathroom. How do people know he fell? Just because they, they didn't anticipate foul play, so that's the only other deduction? The deduction was that there was damage to the base of his skull, fracture that came around his skull and caused a black eye. And he had hit his head because they saw him at 2 o'clock in the morning pulling up in valet, took a picture with valet. They got him on camera going into his room. They knew he was fine going into his room. And when he was dead, when they found him, he had a fracture in his skull. So it had to be a fall or he was a lumbering 6'5 dude or he had to have gotten in bed and just like, you know, Bob was just kind of like, bam. Like I, I, could, I could see him, you know, just like loosely thinking he was falling back to the pillow and banging his head. So it was just a tragic, terrible accident, and that's how he went. And so that was it. How are you? I'm all right. I mean, I'm all right. I've, I've dealt with a lot of tragedy in my life, so I know how to deal. But, like, you know, when Bob died, I was going right into a production, and I didn't have time to, like, oh, mourn this movie it. that you just finished. Yeah, and so it comes out in, like, weird times, like, you know, just, like, weird moments. I'll just be sitting there, and I think about him every day because we talked almost every day. Yeah. And he was just like an older brother and like a mentor type of guy to me. You know, he just always was like, you know, it got like a little over, overbearing. I'm like, Bob, I am a full adult, bro. Like I know how to get an Uber to the hotel. I'll be fine. You know, but he was always just like, make sure you're, you know, 815, get an Uber, make sure you're there on time. I'm like, He's, he wasn't Jewish. Very think, Jewish. Yeah, he, he seems very Jewish, but I don't. I don't think I, I didn't know he was Jewish. I was very. And the way yeah. you're talking about him seems even more Jewish. He, <laughs> double Jewish. Like he's a Jewish mom. Type double of thing. Jewish, bro. He'll cut your meat for you at the table. Like Bob would fucking cut. You know, like you. He came from like a deli, a deli family. Like his dad was in the meat business, so Bob like prided himself on being able to cut deli meat. Like he literally, uh -huh. it's, if you had a steak across from him, give me your damn steak. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow that, but I no, I you would, you it. would not. And but you thank you for offering. But yeah, don't touch my food. But. He was Jewish. He was neurotic. He was hilarious with it. And he was, you know, he was controlling on the road. He liked to like make sure everything was perfect on time. Foods in the green room. Everything was, mm -hmm. you know, sound check. But I learned that even at his level, 
professionalism and sound checking and making sure everything is correct at the show. He didn't let any of that slide. He'd never let any of that stuff slide. So every place we went, 5.30 sound check, no matter what. He never drank before a show. You know what I mean? He was always just kept it professional. And I learned a lot from Bob. You and seem to be really attracted to that because that's how you explain Rappaport. People who I am do. attracted to that. You know why? Because people work too hard at the craft mm -hmm. to like deal with people that are unprofessional and you think it's okay to be la lose, you know, lazy and not on time and you're too cool and I'm not with that shit. I thought about, uh, I didn't bring it up, although organically I am now, but it registered when you got here and you, you were early and not that everybody's late, but people aren't early. It happens yeah. and it's not even necessary, especially because like, you know, it's loose and blah, blah, blah. But I always do notice when people are even on time, I notice when people are on time, let alone early. Yeah. I didn't mean to be that early, by the way, bro. Like my, my buddy picked me up and like I got- I, You were 15 minutes early. It wasn't like yeah, that crazy. Yeah. But I do believe in being on time and being professional. It's like the least respect you can give somebody. What, talking about uh, the respect you give people while you're talking, I'm looking at my cameras, but <laughs> you, get, you know, out of respect, I want to make sure that- By the way, on. I'm just wondering like who, are your editors in the building right now? Are they in this house? No. Are they here? No. So- um, I love how you communicate to the team that's not here, but I know they're going to be here or- it's just your thing, and well, I there used, is nobody. I, uh, um, I don't need to know. Okay. I don't need to know. I just dig it. I don't need to know. But yeah, man, I learned a lot from Bob, and you know, I think it's important to be on, <laughs> on time and professional, and I've dealt with tons of actors now. I'm you know, going on my fourth movie, whatever, and like I've a seen- A Mike Young joint. I've seen, I like a Mike Young joint. That's Spike Lee. I've seen professional. I've seen unprofessional. And I'm going, all, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the questions now when I hire people. Are they known to be professional? Right. And let's, let's work with them. Because I, don't, I just think it's bullshit that, you know, you come with an attitude and you got all these hangups. And I hear just, stories just, of this. I've seen it firsthand. I ne I've never worked with anybody on any jobs I've done that haven't been nice and professional. I've, ne I've heard awesome. tons of stories. I've only experienced it a couple times and I will not name names. I've only experienced it with a couple actors where they were diva-ish and like all of a sudden like my makeup artist is crying. My wardrobe's in a panic. And I'm like, what did they say to you? You know, and it's, yeah. and I get that it comes from like some crazy insecurity that they have but I'm not with it. So just sure. be cool, man. We're all lucky to be in this business, making a living of course. for the time being. Fucking be professional. All we're doing is telling stories to entertain people. Get your diva shit out of there. And by the way, those people don't last long. You know, they don't. They don't. I mean, I, as I say that, I think of like these old school actresses that were known divas that were so good they did last long. But like, I don't think people should need to have patience for that shit anymore. Um. I want to know more of like the 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 the, the juicy like um, you're friends with DiCaprio and like I mean I know Ethan is part of that group too. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that look like? And how does that happen? That happens, believe it or not, from men's league basketball. I'm an open micer or like I'm I'm so let's go back let's go back to my open mic days and I'm starting to get good at comedy. I'm starting to get a little recognition in comedy. I go on the road with Rogan, so I'm getting my chops. I do a year on the road with Rogan. One of my boys who's from LA loves my comedy. He runs the newsstand on Sunset Boulevard. My boy Chuck. He is like Shout the, to Chuck. We'll put his Instagram handle here. Yo, he's awesome. So he grew up here. He grew up around uh, like an Echo Park area. So he grew up with like Leo and like Toby Maguire, like in this LA scene. So he's at the comedy store. And I swear, just one day randomly, 20 years ago, whatever it was, 19 years ago, he's like, yo, we need a fifth. Do you, can you play ball? And I go play ball at the gym center. We need a fifth, by the way, is a concept of something I was writing once. Adult men's league. And one of the episodes was we need a fifth. Talk to me because I love it. I mm -hmm. think there needs to be an adult men adult league I wrote show. It. I can't wait. I, we'll talk about it. We'll make it. You wrote it. I'll make it. So we go. So he's like, we need a fifth. So I go to the gym center and the team is Leonardo DiCaprio, Kevin Connolly, Lucas Haas, Nick Cassavetes. And it's like... $80 million worth of talent is about to play basketball. And I'm from Detroit and I had been playing a lot of ball. So I was good. Right. And so just from playing ball, playing ball every week, we just developed like a friendship with all. I, is Leo good at basketball? He, he doesn't. He, he had a good post-up move. He wasn't a so jump, no. not a great jump. No, no, he could play. 
but he had like come out of basketball diaries and you could tell that he was coached on like a couple basic uh -huh. solid moves. So he had a solid post up. Plus he was like six, you know, he's six one, one ninety. He's big body, strong. He's I didn't realize he, he was tall. He's tall. So that's how I met those guys. And they just like took me into their crew as a friend. And so like for years, I just got a front row seat to like the craziest, most fun time you could ever ask for as a guy who's just a comedian at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you say not, just that you mean, because you weren't doing any other crafts. I, I hadn't, well, no, I hadn't like sold a script. I hadn't directed anything yet. They just knew me as Mike Young, the com their comedian buddy. Why do you meet all these people? Doug, Saget, Leo, any of these people, these producers, what, what is it that when you meet them and more specifically, they meet you, they're in. What do you think it could you and and don't worry about feeling like you're you're saying good things about yourself like really asking if you could define anything anything tangible or intangible that could be defined what is it that they're attracted to what's the through line I don't know man maybe it's I I don't know maybe I'm just like I like people I think I just I'm authentic I don't bullshit I'm like a real person and I think my dad like gave me this gift of like digging people and like truly just like not judging people and being cool with everybody. So I think I just, people are like, people like you. I'm like, I like people. Uh -huh. I'm not one of these negative dudes who's like got a bad thing to say every time they meet somebody. I just don't feel like that. I genuinely dig people. And I think, I don't know, Detroit, outside of growing up outside Detroit, you meet a lot of different mm -hmm. people, kinds of people. And so I think maybe these guys just know that I'm authentic that I'm not a guy that's gonna like bullshit or or you know scam them or like blow up their spot. Then I I could keep a secret. You know what I mean? Like I'm just like I don't being, know, bro. Being I, nice I, and I trustworthy know. is important and necessary, but it's not enough to have people be attracted. It's enough to like and think they're nice, but then then want you around. There's got to be a, there's a charisma. There's a funny. There's a you have to bring something to the table. You said you got from your dad this ability to be interested and like people. Talking about your dad. You my dad was just like a cool dude. Like my dad had friends in cool. Detroit that were like, my dad had a friend that was like, he was the doctor for all the pro boxers. That was the coolest thing. And all the rock and roll people that came from Detroit. I saw how he navigated that world. He had a friends that were like, a, he'd have a friend that was like the top surgeon, but also a friend that was like a gangster in the underworld. Yeah. And I saw how my dad just like moved in these different worlds. And I thought, and he always had me around adults, like, like talking to people. And so I think from my dad, I got the gift of communicating with all types of people. So I don't know how to say it any other way than like, I just dig people and they, they dig, like they think I'm a, I don't know, bro. Do they think I'm cool? I don't know. I'm, That's not, that like what you, I'm not that cool. You're a cool guy. You're a very cool guy. Yeah, but I'm also neurotic and They're Jewishly not exclusive. neurotic. They're mutually exclusive. I'm okay, cool. Well, I appreciate I'm cool it. and I'm, I'm terrified of everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it's what you're so saying. So am I, bro. <laughs> I've been to two doctors this week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate you saying that. And I guess it's just they think I'm a cool dude and I'm fun to hang out with. And I don't like, I, 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 I'm I, good on the team. I'm a good, yeah. I'm good coming off the bench. I got you. I'm good as a starter. I got you. I'm good on the team. And that's kind of how those guys looked at me like, yo, Young is cool to hang out with. Why not? He's fucking funny. He's, you know, just let's see what Young's doing. Like there was, they would just call me to go hang out. And so I would come off stage at the comedy store, never tell any comedian where I was going. And I would walk to the corner, uh, to the West of the comedy store, sort true story. And Leo and to the pink dot. I wouldn't even go to Pink Dot. I just go to that street that's before, like uh, after a katana. And fucking Leo would come down in a Prius with my other buddies, and they'd scoop me up, and we would go clubbing in LA. And I had a 15 year run or whatever it was of the most fun I could ever have. Why does it and, end? Well, just every people got girlfriends. I got engaged at the time. Leo, you know, would be, have a girl dip out. You know, he wouldn't be going to the club so much. But we just had like a chunk of a run just like a fun Hollywood run, mm -hmm. just like I'm on a private plane. It's like real life bro. entourage. It was entourage shit, bro. I'm not even going to lie. Uh -huh. I had, a, I'm not going to lie. If, I might as well just say it. Like next thing I, I like, yo, get a call from Leo's, like the assistant. Like, yeah, tell me, give me stories. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to say too much about 
I'm not going to blow up his world. He's the fucking greatest dude. He really is the coolest motherfucker. Like, I think I'm cool, but then he's even cooler. Like, I'm like, I thought I was like the coolest dude. This motherfucker is extra cool. That's what I wanted to hear. So you do, because you said, I don't know if I'm cool, I'm neurotic, but now here we are. The story's not about you. And you're like, I thought I was the coolest dude. Why didn't you think you're cool? No, but I mean, I know I'm cool to hang out with, but like, this dude's another level of cool. Like he's fucking. You see why it's, it's no he mistake. He almost he was almost Aquaman. Yeah, James was, Cameron almost had him as Aquaman, and he lost to Vinny. He totally lost to him. Man. Yeah, yeah. Get I mean, him on I the remember. phone and tell me why he lost Aquaman. Let's. I'll get him on the phone right now. So anyway, I had a front row seat to that whole fun ride, and I just I loved it. I had a blast. I would always call my boys in Detroit. And go, you're not gonna believe where I'm going, bro. I'm on a private plane going to Miami for New Year's. This is the craziest shit. And sometimes I would say, like, why did they let me come in? But I think it's just, I just got along with everybody and I was non threatening and I was, I'm good on the team, mm -hmm. you know, because you just, you knew what that hierarchy was. And it was just, you know, I was lucky to be there. And I learned a lot, by the way. I learned a lot from those guys. I watched Leo's professionalism. I watched how Toby Maguire was like ultra professional with like his acting and his craft. And like, tell me what that means. What is Leo's professionalism that you saw? Just like, when he did uh, like Aviator, you go to his house and there's like 15 books on Howard Hughes. And you're like, this guy's not just like winging shit. He is like in Good the, pun. he is studying. You know what I mean? I know. Thanks. Put up a picture he's, of the movie with a wing. <laughs> he's studying the craft. And you're just like, as cool as the rest of the world thinks these guys are, they're hyper professionals and they're all about their shit. Mm -hmm. And so that's, they saw that I took comedy and writing just as seriously. And so I think that's why, yeah, I think that's why they respected me and I was cool with it. Did it ever yeah. lose its novelty? And these are just your boys or was there always that awareness of what the fuck is happening? It never lost its novelty, but I probably stopped going what the fuck is happening after it was happening a thousand times. Mm -hmm. And like, there'd be like paparazzi and, you know, who's coming around and check this person, make sure, you know, so the novelty of like, you know, the fact that they're all, they're uber famous. Uh, yeah, maybe that war, that wore off to the point where, I mean, listen, bro, for the first year, I was even like a little nervous. Uh, I'll be I'll, I'll be real. Like it wasn't like I was so comfortable. I was like kind of nervous. Like you know, on a private plane sitting across from him. I'm like, yo, bro, are you, are you nervous about this plane? Like it's a tiny plane. Like he's nervous like, about the plane, not this interpersonal like, relationships. Like both. I was just like a little nervous. Uh -huh. There, I still knew how famous my friends were, so I didn't. I think it took about a year for me to just like settle into my own skin and be like, "All right, motherfucker, let's have a conversation." And then when you realize you could just be real, mm -hmm. and they were just as real back, it lost its novelty, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be just like, "We are friends. Anything you need, I got you," you know. And that was it. We were just were friends. Have you ever wanted to do something that you wrote that had him in? And if so, would you feel comfortable asking him? He probably, I know professionally he does, he's got a whole team that like susses out his thing and I know how it works, but like I had a TV series and I knew his company and he, if he would put on it, if he wanted to put his name on it, I have no problem asking him for that. And he has no problem saying no. Right. And so the, I know the process. But as know? an actor, you wouldn't want to do it. I would love to do it, but like. I'm saying you wouldn't want to ask. Because uh, 15 years, you guys are friends. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would ask. If I had something that I thought Leo would be perfect for, and I'll, the money, I'll, adult men's league, and the and the and the money was behind it in a studio type of way, of course I would ask. And well, the money wouldn't would necessarily be no. behind it, but if he's in it, then they are. He th correct. That is that is true. So I haven't asked him about any of my movies yet. Like it just had, I haven't asked him. Mm -hmm. I've I have asked him for like his company and his name for like TV stuff that I'm doing and things like that. And he said no. His company said no, like right. on the last one. I but I but there's but, an open door policy. Right, it's great when when you feel comfortable. It's great when you you know the other person feels safe and comfortable to say no because then you're not burdening them. Totally, because first of all, I'm coming with something that I think is great, right. and so he knows that I think it's great. So he, it's probably good, and you know he knows that he, whatever. And he's like, "Yo, Mike, here's the number. Call the head of the company. Send it to him. Let him read it. Let's go that route." So I go the professional route. Toby Maguire, yeah. who's a friend, you know, he 
he saw me and, and thought I should have a sitcom at one time and was like, yo, let's develop something for you. So he was cool enough to, we developed a show for a year. We sold it to ABC and we didn't make the show, but like- Did you make the pilot? We didn't make the pilot, but I was in a development deal and they paid me for a year and it was a great Oh, that was thing. the one that expired during season three yeah. of Entourage. Yeah, that was that. And then Toby and I had, we actually did a couple projects together that we sold that didn't make it to the air. But like, I have an open door policy with those guys. And if I feel like, you know, right. they're right for something, I have no problem calling them. But I don't abuse that in any way. And, you know, I realize how fortunate, at least like in this world, like in this entertainment world, I've been to have a cool group of friends that are like supportive and I connect you know. strongly with that and I think on a much obviously smaller scale but I feel that way about my podcast like I've had the coolest people on here people that want to come on here and like guests where I've asked multiple guests why are you here why are you doing this yeah and it just I know why I know why because you, you, because everyone knows who's worked around you or seen your work. They know you're a highly intelligent dude. They know you're seriously a funny dude, and they know you're gonna like, like you're on a great path. And I think people Thanks. can see. No, but I think you're welcome. But I think people can see that, Rick. And you got a million quirks. You know what I mean? My feet, my shoes are off downstairs. I wash my hands before I come on. This makes sense. It's all good. But I think that people game recognizes game. You know what I mean? If you want to quote Snoop right off the jump. I do. I think people recognize that you are a talented, funny dude. So why wouldn't they want to come on? Well, it's now at the point where um, I'm less, why are you doing this? And more like what you were saying about in this pocket and you're grateful and that you're in a great position. I just feel truly like, and again, it's just a podcast and it's a very small bubble of things. I feel this way with the whole career, with a lot of things, but I've really just been feeling so grateful. Like, I'm proud of this podcast. I'm proud of the way it's going. And also, I didn't I grew up not having many friends and I I I I never I don't want to get into all of it. But like I don't know if people like me and it's you know it is what it is and I wasn't even depressed about it. It's just like I'm a weirdo and fine blah blah blah. And I'm like starting to realize that no people like me. I mean some people don't get it and don't, but and I'm just like I just feel really confident and grateful. And then like I'm around these people that are working and doing cool things and like I write something and people will read it and I'm having these cool meetings and it's a very like, at least on surface, it feels, it's like the way I'm talking about is superficial, but like it's my first time ever experiencing, oh, people, people like me and people want to work with me. And it just, it really just feels really, really good. Cause I used to be Great. very nervous asking people to do my podcast. Yeah. Very nervous. Do they feel uncomfortable that I'm even asking them? But it's because they recognize that you're a talented dude and you're a good, you seem like a genuinely pretty, like a good dude. I think it's the latter. At Genu least. Genuinely good dude. Yeah. Yeah. A likable, you're a likable dude. I mean, yes. you know, I, I met you briefly in the, when the, with the Cleveland talk and the, that whole yeah, thing. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Because I remember that, but I don't remember how it went down because Brent was the connection really. Because I knew you then as much as I knew you right before you got here. Uh, how are you on time, by the way? I'm good. I just saw my mom calling. Um, you want to get her on? No, nah, she's. Do you want to? Do you want to? Yeah, I get put my mom on all the time. Front speaker. Ma. What's up? What's going on? So what's going on? Let's see. Oh boy, everything all right? Yeah. Everyone. Your brother went to take the boat with uh, Wes. Tell her keys, my car keys. Yeah, Ma. Listen, <laughs> Ma. Listen, I'm on a podcast. I'm on my oh, friend sorry. Rick's podcast. But he, oh, he let oh, me, yeah. He, yeah, he let me uh, answer the phone while, while you I, were we, we almost named this podcast My Guest and Their Jewish Mothers, so I thought this would be a good opportunity <laughs> to meet you. She is the ultimate. <laughs> okay, guys, enjoy. All right, we'll call you back. <laughs> All right, we'll back. call you back when we plug you in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what were we just talking about? Cleveland Connect. Yeah, so Brent, uh, uh, you're friends with uh, Dan Gilbert? Correct. I mean, who the fuck are you, right? Who am I? By the way, that's why my special is called Who the F is Mike Young? Because all these people would talk about me, but nobody would know really who. Did you film it? I did or, film it. Is it out? It's out now on Bill Burr. Yeah, Bill Burr put it out on All Things Comedy. Oh, when? Like uh, almost a year ago. I See, I don't even know. Yeah, bro, I'm you the gotta... worst promoter <laughs> of my own shit ever. Well, we got to put, put uh, we'll obviously put a link. All Things Comedy gets me the advertisements. I mean, I, I love All Things Comedy. Um, so where do people see it? On all things comedy, YouTube. Like it's on just, YouTube. It's, there. All right, it's called Lincoln, Who the F is Mike Young? We got to get a link in the description. You got a good thumbnail? 
No. I mean, maybe they, they, they run it. That's your problem. Oh, maybe it is. We'll put the thumbnail up. All right. I want to do something. I, I do this every now and then where I want to see how big the reach is. Go over there, watch it. Uh, at least give it five minutes because I can't say you have to watch the whole thing. You have to give it five minutes. How much time do they need to get in, do you think? Is five enough? Six. Six? Give me six minutes. Um, give them six minutes. And if you like it, keep watching. But either way, for the algorithm and to show, to make me see like how big the Take Your Shoes Off reaches. Tyso brought us here. Glassman brought me here. One of those things. Comment that. Give it a thumbs up. And let's see if we could get the numbers to, are you at uh, 30 million yet? No, not even close. Let's see if we could get it to 30 million. This is a big podcast. I love it. Um, who is Mike Young or who am I? Who the F is Mike Young? Who the F is Mike Young? Yeah, you know everybody. Yeah, so that's kind of why I named it the po that podcast because I would get like... Keep it on the brown. Your fingers touch the couch. Did they? Just, <laughs> did they? It's okay. Oh, but, you know, all else is cool. His next show is Keep It On The Brown. I want to get merch that says Keep It On The Brown. For sure. Uh, you asked me if I know Dan Gilbert. Well, no, you do know Dan Gilbert. Yes. That's who got us tickets. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what was that all about? You go to Cavs games a lot? No. So that was, one of the, that was the movie that I wrote that I didn't direct called Adam. That's on Amazon now, starring Jeff Daniels and Aaron Paul. And Dan Gilbert financed that movie. And so we became friends through this movie thing. Oh, you met literally through the business. Through the no. business. But we became great friends because he actually is from my area, like literally outside Detroit. He's from the same neighborhood. Mm. So I knew about him, heard about him. Obviously, he's fame, crazy famous, crazy. For people that don't know, if it wasn't clear already, he owned the Cavs for a very long time. Still owns the Cavs. Oh, yeah? He just yeah. Checked, why did he sell the arena? To his own company. He owns Rocket. He has... Uh, Quicken, Quicken loans, loans and Rocket? Yeah. Why? Why are those two separate things? Because Rocket is a subsidiary of Quicken. Dan, oh, I thought it was another just bank loan thing. No, no. Dan has, Dan just went public. So he just, cha so he just changed his name from Take Your Shoes Off Stadium to uh, Rick Glassman Stadium. Like he just, it's all it. his. It's all wow. his. Wow. Yeah, it's all his. Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Well, shout out to Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse and we'll put their Instagram handle up here. Go ahead. Okay. So Dan, yeah, so I met him through this movie. So they were going to, I got a phone call one day. I mean, do you want the this, this story? I don't know. Is, what, tell me, is the story worth telling? It's pretty cool how I met Dan. I mean, because you're talking about how I come in contact with like these people. And like, I got a phone call one day from a dude that knew, that worked for Dan. And they, he had written a journal about his life. He had a tragic accident. He said, Dan Gilbert is going to make a movie out of his life. Would I want to meet Dan and talk about being the writer? Mm -hmm. And so... And they saw one of your movies and thought they that saw was... Both, yeah, they saw one of my movies. Thought I was... <laughs> plus, I'm from Detroit area. I'm from Southfield, so maybe where you Dan's get his, from. you get his tone, his I voice. get the tone. I get the area. And I knew the kid who the movie was about. And so he's like, would you, would you talk to Dan? And so long, crazy story short, I talked to Dan Gilbert on the phone after, read, after, after, after reading this kid's journal about his life. And it's literally one of the most hilarious and tragic stories I ever read. So I already had a take on it. And so he put me in touch with Dan Gilbert, got on the phone. Dan's like, I'll fly you to Detroit. Let's talk. I meet Dan Gilbert in Detroit. A meeting becomes a four-hour meeting. He's like, yo, bro, come. You got to come on my plane this weekend. We're playing Seattle, and then we're playing the Clippers. I'll drop you in L.A. Amazing. Y you got the job. Swear to God, that's how spot. it went down. On the wow. spot. Shook my hand, called my lawyer on a Monday. I wrote a movie called Adam. On a Tuesday. It, on a t <laughs> <laughs> And it's out now. And so, yeah, man, I've been... I'm like the Forrest Gump of uh, this whole thing. <laughs> I, I don't know how I end up in these weird worlds. And world. you were a producer on Forrest Gump, right? Exactly. Can it's you fucking believe nuts. that? I can. Yeah. I absolutely can. It's based on my life. Who the F is Mike Young? Are you happy with it? I am happy with it. Uh, there's a couple moments in there I wish I kind of did better. And then, so I weave narrative scripted into my stand-up. So I played the Beacon Theater, right? Mm -hmm. I played the Beacon. I played the Beacon. Yeah, I shot it there. And then I thought it would be cool... To have this concept of like how life feeds your art, so I like didn't I hired some actors. I so I did narrative, scripted into the stand up, uh -huh. back into the narrative, into the stand up, and so I did that. And, it's and like Bill a, Burr and All Things Comedy produced it. They did not. They just bought it and so you self financed I self financed it, self pr produced it on my own. You know I'm a numbers guy. What does it cost to self finance that 90, in the theater? It, it was like a hundred thousand, maybe hundred thousand, and then you sell it to them. Or you partner with them? I partner with them. And you make your money back? No. Right. That's a lot of money just to go on YouTube. Yeah. 
I don't make my money. I will make my money eventually with that. Um, How do you get money from that? I mean, it's just YouTube ads. It's just YouTube ads, but I'm saying I will... I already know that like within the year, I'm going to strike a deal with, with those guys and like say we need to take it from here and take it over here. And I know a company that's already kind of and, and they'll still, they'll, so a company could still pick it up even though it's already been out because you would, you would then take it off YouTube. Yes, I would take it off YouTube and I would turn it into, I would turn that concept into a bigger concept. Oh, like, you'd do a new one. Yes, I would do a new right. one and we would call it like that was the, we would call it that was the first season of this show. Great. So I would break it into like seven minute episodes or whatever. Yeah. So I, I have some ideas because I just, people, people dig it and I just want to let it sit there for maybe another six months and then take it somewhere else and, and try to. Is there a clip that going. you really like that you'd feel comfortable that we could cut to real quick? Like something that's 30 seconds? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, Mike Young? Look at you working from home now, huh? Shit, yeah. You want to take shoes off? Yeah, man. Every day is casual Tuesday. Rick, have you directed um, anything? Yeah. So you, you told me something that, well, this podcast, but you yeah. said something when you were doing um, your first movie where you walked in and there's the art department and all these things and the line producer is busting your balls and blah, blah, blah. I had my version of that. Um, I was on a show called Undateable and yeah. uh, I, was, I was the sixth lead on that show. I know you've heard about the sixth lead and you're a big fan. Um, so I wrote this thing. It was just a five minute little video called The Sixth Lead that was very inspired by me going to have a conversation with Bill Lawrence. Do you know Bill? Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. Uh, he was the showrunner and, yeah. crew, uh, and and I had this meeting with him where I play a heightened version of myself. It's very Curb inspired. Yeah. Um, and he loved it. And he's like, will you make more? And he gave me two days, the Warner Brothers lot, whatever I could do. So I wrote a fair amount of episodes. I had, a, I had not enough time. So I had it to two episodes into one for a few of them. I ended up making five episodes and I got to be, I had a, I had, cause it was the NBC undateable Warner Brothers department was making it. I had costumes. I had background. They shut down multiple streets. I had craft services and security and I'm in charge of this thing. And I, I mean, I'd been making sketches forever, but it was always me standing in for myself to, or my buddy, John helping to focus. And, and now I have this thing. I'm like, I, my feeling, at least in this thing, was less overwhelming and more how much this podcast is overwhelming. Having all these people doing all of these things. Yep. And yes, I need to give them answers, but like better than me doing it and not knowing that much about lighting and sound. Yep. It was, I always want to direct, but having, I'm going to send it to you. No obligations, but at least watch the first I'll six definitely minutes. Watch it. And uh, I got to do this. So my... I, writing and directing, I love acting, but yeah. I want to be directing. Yeah, you have a director's brain, and you you'll be a very good director. I could tell you, I could see that right now. Thank like you, so you you're, you're very clear on what you want. Like it takes me some time to like tell my editor even you know what I'm looking for, how to how to phrase it perfectly so he doesn't get confused. You have a good director's brain. I could see that, but that is that's a bro. When Bill Lawrence gives you time on the studio lot and a lot to do your thing it was awesome you're, you're on a you're, you're in a good lane buddy that's that's a that's a compliment um at I the also, highest level by the way bill lawrence is no joke he's a great he's he is no joke um and i'm also gonna give, uh, give another plug which you know it's my channel so you probably already know but um very long story short i'm not gonna get in i'll tell you after if you're interested very long story very short i meet bill lawrence at the hollywood improv i get into his basketball game that's how i got every my first jobs with all this stuff um i ended up getting kicked out of that basketball game four years later i got back in for being too intense and i i people didn't like playing with me i was loud i was abrasive all these things um i ended up uh uh writing this thing first it was adult men's league i put that away uh i did this other thing and bill and my buddy john stern and i were going out to pitch this thing uh, and then I booked this Amazon show, so I couldn't. I put it aside. Okay. Cut to three years later, my editor, John Michael, and I are watching. The footage is great, and I put it out. I'm going to send this to you. It's called I Am Phenomenal. It's about me being the best basketball player there is, but nobody else agreeing. And uh, the script, Joel McHale plays Bill Lawrence, and the script is written from this email that Bill sent me. So it's like, a, it's all real, but That's it's great. Um, what was the point of that, Bill? Oh yeah. So Bill, even when he had to kick me out of a basketball game, was still willing to like, want to go pitch this thing with me. And it just felt like, 
if you're funny, you know, yeah. people like you. Totally. At least more than they would if you weren't funny, yeah. you know? Yeah. Maybe that's the answer to what your question was earlier. Like, why do these guys like you? Maybe because cause I'm funny. Maybe. I don't like being around people who don't make me laugh. Yeah. I mean, funny is everything. It's like, see, the world is funny. funny I, you know? Yeah. I'll, funny I'll, is with that. Funny is good is the good looks for guys. I think so. Mm-hmm. But I have a question. You got thrown out of a basketball league, which is super interesting. So that you got a crazy competitive spirit, uh, right? Very. Hyper competitive. So that combined nice. with a lack of awareness. <laughs> so as nice and cool and chill and funny as you are, there's a there's a side to you that's that's hyper competitive without being aware of how aggressive and competitive you are. Uh, I because I, I dig it. I love healthy competition because I got into shit all the that's time. That's how you. That's how I. That's how I connected. My fir- I first got friends because now we're playing aggressive and we're fighting and like, all right, let's. I got Glassman. I I always remember like when people would I walk in a gym say I got Glassman. And I thought I did it. <laughs> you know, like people want me around now. Uh huh. Which is different when you're playing with people who aren't there just to win. That they're there just to have a good time. Yeah. And to me, having a good time is not sitting and waiting for the next game. Totally. I so relate to that mm-hmm. because I. I think that might have been one of the reasons those guys dug me too, because in our first basketball game against the other team, this dude set a crazy surprise pick on me, and I felt like he really like dropped his shoulder into my chest, and just on instinct, I just go, "Do that shit again, motherfucker!" I just said that, mm-hmm. like that was what came out of my mouth, and I was ready to go, like I was ready to fight, like right there. Do you get in a lot of fights, or is that just on the basketball court you feel tough? No, I don't. I don't get in a lot of fights. I've <laughs> been in a number, a decent number of fights but I don't like to fight. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I like to fight. I, I like to box. Like I like boxing. I like getting in the ring and like sparring. I used to do that. Yeah. There's something. I do like there's something to fight. Fun. No, I mean, not, I mean, fighting isn't, you're, even if you win, you're hurt. Every, you're going to yeah. get hit at least once. Yeah. But like, yeah, fighting with people in a competitive, like not, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm just trying to beat you. Totally. Type Healthy of way. competition. Like, let's go. But. I used to wrestle with people all the time and I found out they, they, I was just too intense for them. Yeah. But I boxed as a kid. Like, I literally boxed for a long time. Like, Mm -hmm. me and my brother took, I told you my dad, like, his friend was the doctor for the boxing team in Detroit. So I was around it a lot. So I do like the discipline of it, which makes you way more calm in regular, in regular life. Like, I have no road rage, like, nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, like, I'm I'm chill. You seem like a no road rage kind of guy. I'm a no road rage kind of guy. But like, yeah, I, I, used to li- I, I used to like a good scrap when I was growing up. I didn't mind it, but I know how serious it can get and how mm-hmm. stupid it is. But I, I never picked a fight. But right, we were, never, you were, go back to you were connecting. You, you were on the basketball court. You're being aggressive. You like that stuff. I think that my boys were like, yo, Young is like, Young's just <laughs> stepped up for himself in this. Like, they didn't some really people know are me. attracted to that. And some people think, just fucking relax, dude. No, but this dude dropped a hammer on me. Like, th- he deserved it. Yeah. Uh, we, we were going to go. Like, he, I, I don't like, like He like hurt me a little bit. You know, it was like a blindsided cheap shot. So I think that they respected that. And I think they just like took me to another level early. I love how much both of us in our own lane are working because of basketball and comedy. Yeah. Like you have to be funny to get the thing, but the, all the opportunities came from Totally. They came basketball. from men's league sports uh-huh. and making connections and sports relationships. Sports is so important. It is. It it's really a, is. It's because it's, it's a community of people that are put in a position and they may be very different, but they're forced and they agree to having the common goal. And it just teaches you to work together. 100%. That's it. And it's also, it's the, it's the ultimate equalizer. So like you might be the top box office draw. Yeah. But you're number three on the basketball court. Uh-huh, you know uh-huh. what I mean? You might be Spider Man, yeah. but you might be the sixth man, uh-huh. like coming off the bench. So like it just equalizes everybody, yeah. and it just is a great, you know, I don't know. I, I love Fucking love basketball. Dude. I love basketball. I love hockey. I, I love growing up playing sports. Mm-hmm. So it, I really do attribute that. And I think there's a little athleticism to stand up, even like there's a little bit of physicality that you can people could see if you're athletic or not up there unless you're just a standstill guy I, I don't know yeah i guess i don't know if i don't know if i've made that observation it makes sense i'm a pacer so like i have like a rhythmic pace to my stand up a little bit no no never okay never but i was but i did see that game where they the 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 malice at the palace i remember i remember i was at rockney's at kent state where i went to school and Damn. i was watching the game and then just wait what the fuck is happening that was nuts yeah yeah but no, men's league has given me tons of opportunities and playing sports has put me into a world that I never thought I would be in. But doing You never the, made a basketball thing though. 
no, I haven't made a basketball thing yet. I, w- I have a men's league hockey thing mm-hmm. that I want to do. With Bill? No. Well, no you know, he's I'm, a big ho- Bill Burr, not Bill Lawrence. Oh, Bill Burr. No, I never even thought of that. I he's should, a big oh, hockey maybe guy. Maybe I'll bring it to Bill. He is a big hockey guy. I skated with Bill before. I've skated with Bill. You he guys buddies? Play. Yeah, we are buddies. We were, we're recent buddies. Like even when all things comedy like took my special, I wasn't, re- I didn't really know Bill that w- uh-huh. well. And I was like a little intimidated, but he's just like a real dude. He's just a good dude. And you know, I, I'd say we're good acquaintances now, you know, like I have no problem texting Bill something funny. Like, he's one of the, he's one of the best. And as much as I know people that are awesome and more famous than Bill and have done a lot of things, um, I did a, uh, a old dad's Bill's movie. I did just a day on it. Oh, nice. And I don't know him very I read well. that. It's great. I read it. It was great. And I actually, I tried to get them, I tried to get Dan Gilbert and those guys to, to kick money in early when they were first starting uh-huh. to look at it. And they, they didn't even really pay attention. And I knew, I think that movie's going to do something. I haven't I, seen I, a cut, but that shit was funny Bill as Bill Burr, hell. Bobby Cannavale, who's one of my favorites. Please. Have you ever seen Win Win? Of course I've seen Win Win, bro. Movies. And I also tried to get Cannavale. I couldn't afford him. I tried to get him in my last two movies. I couldn't afford my kind of holiday. He's unbelievable. Yeah. But the reason I bring it up is I did one day on this movie with them, and I see Bill Burr at the comedy store a month later. I say that's relevant because I didn't just see him. It's a month has passed. He's very busy doing a lot of things. And I didn't know him really before. And uh, he was walking out of the comedy store, and he goes, hey, Rick, uh, good to see you, whatever. And I was just... It brought me back to like, I'm new and I just got here and I go, he knows my name. Yeah, totally. You know, because it's fucking Bill Burr. Bro. It made me I, feel so good. I still feel that exact way a lot of times. Like, especially, About who? Well, Burr, with Burr also. Like, he's I, got something. I saw him at Sebastian's uh, kid's birthday party and he's like, hey, Mike, sit down. And like, we sat down, we like talked for like an hour, but there was a little dialogue, uh-huh. like, it was a little monologue in my brain going, Burr fucking knows my name. Uh-huh. Like, how's he know my name? Yeah, you're friends with Leo, but Bill Burr knows your name. Burr knows you know? my name. It happened, but Hannibal Burris knew my name too. Fuck! And I'm so insecure that I thought he thought I was somebody else. He's like, dude, I love this bit that you do. I'm like, oh, he thinks I'm somebody else. Oh, that's He's going to quote the bit, and he, it's definitely not me. It's going to be somebody else's bit. Yeah, and he quoted my bit, and I was like, fucking Hannibal Burris knows who I am. Are you a big fan of him? I am. Like, yeah, I think he's cool, and I think he's got an original style. Yeah, I think he's funny, too. I just thought it was cool that he knew me and my bit. Like, you just don't know. Yeah, but Bill Burr, dude. Yeah, Burr, Burr knows my name, bro. I also think there's something. It's athletes are number one. Yeah. Um, athletes are number one. And then, you know, if Bill Burr, Seinfeld, you know, I mean, I guess yeah. Chappelle. Uh, but uh, Chappelle knows my name. Does he? Yeah. I opened for Chappelle for 14 shows, and when I, but not when I first started comedy, but we had the same manager for a chunk of time, and I got to open for Dave for like cool. seven in San Fran, seven in Sacramento. But that's one of the things where like I didn't see him for a while, and I just thought he doesn't know my name anymore. Like this is just, the most insecure part of the podcast, by the way. All we're talking about is just who, being, who knows. Our, yeah, but yeah, like but, I did. But you talk about these certain comics, and you're like. Yeah, but I really didn't think I really didn't think he remembered my name, yeah. even though we went to dinner all the time. Like, I just figured that was just a chunk of time he forgot. But you know, he he does remember my name. I always assume people. I feel good don't about remember my that. name because I don't remember names too, and I don't, I don't even it doesn't even bother me. Uh, I did a movie with Joel McHale. Then Joel McHale comes and does my podcast, so we have a conversation in the living room. A year goes by. I see him at a farmer's market, and uh, I say, Joel. He turns around, and I go, Rick Glassman, and he goes, I know. I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, I, I never know if somebody knows. And I get so nervous, like what you've said about Hannibal. What, what, the only, if you don't know who I am, I'm not uncomfortable. What right. would make me uncomfortable is if you feel you need to pretend you know who I am. Totally, totally. And I would want to be like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You know? I love the insecurity of comedians and Jewish and Jews. Like, I just, I just like being insecure. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. I, yeah, I, I think it's awesome. Uh-huh. Bill knows my name. Uh-huh. Chappelle knows my name, you know? And it matters. It matters. It does. Because there's some type of, yeah, first of all, they can your know brain. your name and not like you or not think you're funny. Yeah. But there's just some type of kind of primal validation of these people that there are people that you look up to. And there are people that are great and then there's people you look up to. Yeah. And there's people that you look up to, they, they know your name. It's almost like they see you a little bit and that just feels, it just feels good. It's valid. I don't even know if that's an insecurity, but the way we're talking about it sounds like it. No, it but it, it. it just goes to all you want is validation from the people you look up to. Like legit validation to like where you go, oh shit, he thinks I'm funny? Then I'm funny. Like or at dude, least knows my name. <laughs> or at least knows my name. No, but like 
if course. you ever get a, you know what I'm saying? If you get a legit compliment on your work from someone whose work you respect, you know you're in the game. And you could tell when it's authentic or it's not. I mean, they're not going to spend a lot of time. You know, I always felt like the comedy store guys that I was friends with, like the Sebastian, Bobby Lee, my class that I kind of came up with, we weren't really friends with like unfunny dudes, just to be real. Like, Nobody is. So like, I'm just saying, like we weren't friends with like well, dudes. I'm, I- Pardon the interrupt. I just want to say because that sounded harsh. I mean, nobody, no people, comics. I could at least speak for, but I think it's yeah, at least comics. Everybody who's their friends, they at least think are funny. Hundred percent. Not to say that other people aren't, but just saying like you only want to be around people that make you laugh. Yeah. Because otherwise, what's the what are we doing? Yeah, and who you respect in the comedy game. Yeah. So there's there's something to that. So yeah, like when when they, when they knew my name, it was like it was like a whole thing. I was uh-huh. like super. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I, I made it. You know, Seinfeld came to see Sebastian at the Beacon. Came backstage. Was wow. like, you're funny, man. Wow. Where are you from? I'm like, I'll retire. <laughs> I'll retire. It's over now. Uh-huh. I, I'm good. Seinfeld yeah. knew my name. Uh huh. I wonder if he remembers my name. No. Nah. There's not a chance. He's cool. Have you met Seinfeld? I've met Larry a few times, but never Jerry. Jerry is fuck, he's fucking cool, man. He's at the improv. Like, I had a like show the other day. Surprisingly cool. Not that I, I'm surprised that he's cool, but he was like a regular. He just rolled right into the green room with me and Sebastian and was just like kicking it. There's also, uh, like you were talking about in the basketball court, the playing field's leveled. When you're associated with another person who is a peer of somebody else's, there's kind of like the, the barrier would probably be down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I walked by him. He was. Uh, I was going to the improv, and he popped in the show before. So we're going like this, and I walked by him like this. This wasn't my. Maybe it was, but my feeling was this. So I walked by, and I'm and I'm with my cousin at the time, and I, we walked to the improv, and I told my cousin, uh, Danny, I, I, uh, I'll be right back. I just have. To, I have to walk by him again, and I. I don't. I. I know why I did it. Because I wanted to feel it, I don't. I can't explain what that means. But I didn't even walk by him to talk to him. No, I didn't even look at him. I walked by. I just wanted to feel walking by him again because it felt so good. And I walked by him, and I went to the Fred Siegel parking lot. And I didn't want to turn right back around because then he would feel like, "Why well, is this guy just walking by me?" So I went to the parking lot and I took my headphones out of my pocket. And as I'm walking back, I'm putting. The, I didn't even look at him. I put the headphones in. So if he did notice, he'd be like, "Oh, he must have just gone to get his headphones." But just so I could walk by him twice. <laughs> that is amazing that you played out an entire one act play uh-huh. just to walk by Seinfeld. And I, I crushed it. Killed it. I walked by, he goes, good headphone bit. <laughs> by the way, he's so intuitive, he probably didn't uh-huh. know what you're doing. He did he probably didn't notice. He's a he's an observational dude. All right, I want to wrap this up. Cool. Uh, but I also I would love to have you back on if you ever want. And or when this movie comes out. You'll we'll let's do a commercial for it. You'll we'll do a thing. You could just do it on your iPhone or whatever. Appreciate um, that. But uh, uh, who the f is Mike Young? If you have one call to action today, let's go over there. Watch at least six minutes. Leave some comments. And uh, is there anything else you want to plug? Talk about the real Mike Young Instagram. Uh, yeah, the real Mike Young. Follow me at the real Mike Young. That's it. I uh, super appreciate you having me, Rick. This was awesome. You're a funny dude. Thank you're, you. You're awesome, dude. And, uh, I love your originality and yeah, no, just, just, yeah, just who the F is Mike Young. Watch it. Follow me at the real Mike Young. That's it. The other things you, you'll, you'll catch as they come by. All right. I guess, uh, well, as, as I mean, the kids are, it's such a weird thing. It's such a different generation, but what they all say now is at the end of the podcast, scoot do. Bubbity blue. Scoot do. Blubbity blue.